Well, here today with me, my good friend Jay mm -hmm. Jay uh, Manifold. Jay's from uh, Kansas City. He's with the Astronomical Society of Kansas City and various other operations up there. And so he, uh, well, he's a uh, about as close as you can get to a professional astronomer and still consider himself to be amateur, maybe. I don't know. Um, so, anyway, yeah, uh, that's my thinking, anyway. Um, I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> but but we, uh, we, uh, we took a trip, and uh, so Jay's going to talk a little bit about that, I guess, first. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you a little bit about... Um, uh, initially, I, I, I do want to get to the trip, but um, I am going to have you quantify uh, some things about what is called the Wadlow structure. And the, the way I'm going to set that up is um, I met you um, through a mutual contact in the ASKC, uh, a gentleman named David Neuenschwander, um, who for some years lived in deep water and commuted all the way to Lenexa four days a week for a job, which is one of the longer commutes um, I've ever heard of in my life. And But anyway, he was very active in the ASKC, but he was living in, uh, in I guess that's St. Clair County. Uh, maybe it's Henry County. I, I forget. He's real close to the... It's somewhere up there. <laughs> real close to the border, and it's, yeah, it basically gets around Truman Lake. Well, at some point, he met you, and um, became aware of your work, and that led to you uh, speaking to the ASKC, I think more than once. Um, but um, and I kind of uh, I kind of latched on uh, at some point, and things kind of went from there. And just uh, just fortuitously, which was just which was just wonderful, you knew you knew Andy Klein down here uh, when he was teaching multimedia journalism which is not very much like geology or astronomy. Um, and I had met Andy at a blogger meetup in Kansas City in like 02 or 03 when he was teaching at Park. And that was before he came down here. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it just, it just turned into one of these wonderful kind of networking things. And it was just, it was fun. It was just nonstop fun. So... Anyway, um, your again your your connection to astronomy is through uh, really through planetary science and, and specifically through uh, impacts and uh, and this one in particular, which uh, is uh, I think becoming a little bit better known with time. But I am not sure how many people even in Kansas City are aware of the existence of the Wadlow structure. So yes, uh, what I'm going to ask you is. Um, Basically, again, to quantify it, uh, when, uh, where, how big, uh, how big is the structure, how big was the impactor, some of the numbers uh, surrounding that, how, how you visualize it from uh, that, that, that kind of quantification. What, what would it have been like? To be there, presumably a safe distance away. Yeah. Uh, to be there, wherever there was, whenever it was, uh, what would it have been like to witness that impact? What What would you have seen before, during, after? A long time ago, in a galaxy really pretty close to mm. us. <laughs> yes. In fact, it is us. Yes. 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 In this galaxy. Yes. But a long uh, time ago. In a in yeah. one of the spiral arms of the outer reaches of this galaxy, yeah. Yeah. there was this planetary body that was the third orbit around the sun. And then, um, yeah, so about 340 million years ago, that's an estimate, 335 or 340 roughly, um, there was an impactor that came from outer space that hit this planet. Now, we know that there's... You know, impactors happen all the time, right? You've looked at the moon, right? And so right. craters all over the moon, any other planetary body, we know that they've had impacts as well, like Jupiter and, and so forth. Uh, so back 340 million years ago, we picked up a stray. And uh, so this thing collided with Earth. It was, uh, the estimates are, and this is from uh, Jay Malosh and Gareth, I'd have to think of his last name. <laughs> Gareth, um, I can't think of the right Gareth right now. So anyway, uh, they, they have a program that's called Impact Earth. Is that and Arizona, can, Arizona State? He was a, he's uh, a Purdue he's now. A so yeah. Now. yeah. Yeah. I remember the... Gareth uh, Collins, that's who it is. Yeah, so Gareth Collins. Yeah. And so the, the, uh, they have a program where you can put in the, right. the density of the impactor. And so when we... Uh, 
velocity. Uh, velocity and so forth, yeah. So the things that we know about this impactor, I should say first, it left a calling card. Um, okay, so 2003, I think it was. Um, I was working late one night at Missouri State University. We were Southwest Missouri State at the time. And, um, and as I was working late, I knew that there had been this hypothesis pitched the previous, like in 1995, that there was a serial impact on Earth. And that impact uh, was thought to have been something like the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comets that struck Jupiter back in 1994. Of course, people want to well, get on the coattails of something oh, yeah, very sure. spectacular sure. like that. So it was Mike Rampino from NASA who did that. And he, he had a colleague who was actually a, a botanist, I think. But uh, and, and so Rampino and Timothy Volk, uh, propose this hypothesis, there was this multiple impact on Earth as well that would mimic something like was on uh, was on Jupiter. Other folks, having uh, heard their proposal, I guess I would say it's, it is a hypothesis, and they heard that hypothesis. And so folks from the, uh, I think it's the, um, well, what's the name of that uh, journal that's the uh, Oh, it's been too long <laughs> since I read it now, yeah. but it's it's not Pegasus, but it's something like that. In Icarus, it's an Icarus. Icarus yes. So yes. in Icarus, the uh, Icarus is a planetary science. It's a planetary a science. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, and so there was a, a, a counter proposal in there that says, no, there's no way that that could be a multiple impact on Earth because they're too close together. They'd have to be spread apart much, much farther than what they are. And so, um, and so that proposal was put out there as the follow up to the serial impact hypothesis of 1995. I think maybe 1996. I think there were two different journals that Rampino had published in. And so, um, thinking that there may be some meteorite impacts in the mid continent region, I just come back here from California, having worked at the U.S. Geological Survey. And one of the skills I learned out there was to make digital elevation models. And so I began to make digital elevation models of all of the proposed impact structures along that 38th parallel. Well, it's 38th parallel latitude north from uh, the equator, of course. And and so um, with that in mind, I began to download the DEMs, which are free to download at the time. What's a DEM? uh, Digital elevation model. Got it. And so there are different varieties of those. Uh, you can still get them for free nowadays, but most people actually go for LIDAR data these days. Uh, but that wasn't available back in 2002, 2003. Uh, so in, I think maybe it was, 2000, it was 2002 when I did this, actually. And, and so it was like right around the end of October, beginning of November, I think it was. And so um, what I did was I, I, I pieced together four of these. I used a program called MacDEM. And, uh, and downloaded these STDS variety of, of digital elevation models, stitched it together. And, you know, you, you look at things and it's like, oh, I can't see anything there. And you look, you know, zoom in as much as you can to try to find the round thing that's associated with these things, right? And it's like, I couldn't see anything. And so I finally got frustrated at the end of this, having stitched four of these quadrangles together. It's a seven, four, seven and a half minute quadrangles. So you're looking at something about 15 minutes by 15 minutes or a quarter of a degree, which is a pretty good big slice of earth if you think about it that okay, way. Which is going to be, okay, a quarter of a degree. Yeah. That's going to be 20, 15 by 20 miles 20 or something. 20 by 30 yeah. kilometers yeah. on a side. Something like yeah, that. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, two o'clock in the morning, I was like, it's time to call it quits. I saved it to my desktop. This was an old red iMac Model C or Model 3. I forget what it was. I still have that computer. Um, and so I saved it to that computer. And on the desktop where I saved it, there was this image. And that's like, there's a round thing right in the middle of that DEM, the well, stitch DEM. there you go. Yeah, I was All like, right. so what, well, you know, it's like, yeah. and so you open it up and again immediately. And, of course, there's the round thing there. And then you keep looking, you know, this so you is, keep, yeah. Th- this is where I interrupt to say that, that you, you can see part of that round thing very easily. On a map of Missouri, look at the Osage Arm of Truman <laughs> Reservoir at Osceola. And uh, there's, a, there's a very clear arc. It is basically the northwestern uh, quadrant, roughly, of, uh, of the, the, the tectonic. Tectonic so, rim, uh, yeah. It's rim. a tectonic rim, yeah. yeah. So if you have... Driven, and I mentioned this in my story. If you have crossed 
um, that that arm of Truman Lake on Missouri Highway 13, the the bluffs on the north side, um, it just <laughs> just south <laughs> of Osceola Cheese. Um, that's uh, there's a, that, there's that's a little a, deformation right there. Basically, a crater yeah. rim. Yeah, it uh, is. So it yeah. is. So so okay. So um, the next day, um, you know, to kind of short a little bit. Uh, I showed it to one of my colleagues the next day, and he just shook his head, and he just, you know, it's like, and he didn't know what it was either. So the next day, Saturday, I drove up, yeah. and I stopped at one of the outcrops along the highway there, and it was a carbonate breccia. Mm -hmm. And I'd already expected to find a breccia up there because there are some in the Pennsylvanian around there. And it's like, well, what's this? And I looked around, you know, found some fossils and things like that, brought them back. Brought some rock back, and you know, and one thing comes to another. Immediately, you think it's like, well, one of these things really is an impact, and it's like, then the hard work starts. <laughs> so yeah, you really have to uh, get the evidence in to make it uh, to make a case for these things being an impact. So uh, to put the story in short, a short form, I've had uh, one colleague I worked with, and another colleague who has since passed away, and he was working on with a five-axis universal stage on a petrographic microscope, which will orient uh, mineral samples relative to the C-axis of quartz. And so we looked for shock, quart shock quartz. And so we found some shock quartz with this, and enough to publish an extended abstract. And then within a year, year and a half, he had passed away from cancer. And so I now have another colleague I'm working with at uh, SUNY uh, System, and, and he's in Brooklyn, I think. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt again and mention yeah. the, the shock quartz is significant because it's something you find when a tremendously powerful shock wave has passed through rock. And on Earth, there are basically two ways to get shock quartz. One is from a large impact like this, where some extraterrestrial impact has hit and made a crater and all that. And the other is from nuclear testing. Yep. yep. And um, I, they, it may have been discovered initially from nuclear testing. I'm not sure, uh, but I kind of suspect it was because, believe it or not, no, hardly anybody really even thought Earth could have craters on it until about, gosh, 1964, some crazy late date, thanks to Eugene Shoemaker's work at uh, largely at Berenger Crater in Arizona, maybe some other places. So, um, yeah, I mean, this this is actually some pretty recent science, but yeah, obviously yeah. We, were, we were setting off nukes um, before that, um, and we're kind of learning in an interesting way. Um, I, I think it was actually a Missourian happens. who found the first shock quartz okay. from an impact structure. Wow. I think his name was Bob Dietz. Okay. And so I think he was at MU, actually, uh, at the right. time. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he certainly had been around and, and had proposed that, uh, I think it was Crooked Creek was the first one to okay. actually have okay. shock and quartz, which is, is pretty amazing. That is one of the 38th parallel. It is. It is. Right. Yeah. And then there's that one, and then there's Decaturville, yes. uh, which is just south of Camdenton. And you can, you can drive through that one, too, on Missouri Highway 5. Yeah. And once you know it's there you realize that you're going over a crater rim when you when you go in and out of it, but you, you've got to know it's there. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the same with Crooked Creek. Crooked Creek has a nice, you know, central uplift with it. Uh, Decaturville certainly has and and Wamblo, it's like you can't see it. And no, so Wamblo's unusual yeah, in that in yeah. an aspect. So yeah. when it when you look a little closer at the big round thing, so, okay, so the big round thing was like 19 kilometers across, 12 right. miles across, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, but it's like it had this other ring inside of it. Yeah, there was a, a ring off, set off to the south mm -hmm. and west, yeah. and it was about five miles across this second inner ring, mm -hmm. if you will. And I, I, I was kind of a host for a conference we did for SEPM one year in 2005. And one of the one of the conference uh, specialists came up to me and says, "This is unlike anything we've ever seen before, right?" It's like that's not right. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's only, you know, because you're not going to see anything that's going to be anything other than round to begin with, pretty much, right, right. unless it's really, really low angle strike, yeah, yeah. or if you have a, uh, you know, it's like you know, how do you get an eccentric ring around it like that? Well, that took a little bit of, you know. Uh, you know, thought experiment actually to to come up with that and and the whole reason for that of course is the target rock that's there it's all limestone wow. okay. so it's limestone that's very brittle and so outside of the five 
mile across, eight kilometer, what we what we today, it's not the central uplift. It's actually, we call it the main impact area. Right. And that's where the, the meteorite actually struck. Which, by the way, is around Vista, Missouri. Yeah, or, just, uh, just south of Vista. Right. Okay. Yeah, north of Collins, a little bit north and west of Collins in that area. And so, uh, yeah, so the 12-mile feature on the outside of this five-mile diameter, uh, unusual feature, uh, is the tectonic rim. And so it would have disrupted things 12 miles out. So how do you get eccentricity and impacts? It's never really been documented before. And so this the publication, when it finally comes out, after my friend, I have a friend who's working at SUNY Brooklyn. He's, I think he's at Brooklyn College. Uh, but he, it's a two year uh, institution he's at, but he has a universal stage and he's agreed to work on the shock quartz with me. So, uh, so he's making it possible to, uh, to actually substantiate this and get it into the quote unquote official impacts, you know, terrestrial impacts. Right. And there's roughly about 200 of them on Earth. So. Yeah. And, uh, I believe, um, almost all continental or any of marine. Two of them are marine. Two marine. Yeah, yeah, so, right. yeah, there's one off the coast of Nova Scotia, I think it is, and another off the north coast now, of Norway. is that, an, as we say, to use a very fancy term, an observation selection effect? There's certainly or, a bias. <laughs> oh, or, yeah, yeah, because clearly it's going to be easier to find them on land than in the yeah. ocean, but there's also some pretty fundamental differences between the kinds yeah. of crust, right? Yeah, so, there is, so, yeah. age-wise and also... Uh, it's kind of difficult to get to the ocean floor, you know. So, uh, not so, as easy. Yeah, yeah right. and, wow. and so the but the ocean floors are in, in nowhere on Earth much older than about 194 million years old. Okay, so that's and so, right. so the, so the continents are like in the billions, some yeah, of them, you know. Sure, so sure. we have uh, 1.4 billion year old rocks here in Missouri, even some yeah. of them, yeah. uh, some of the yeah, oldest and anyway. That's over around elephant rocks, elephant right? rocks, yeah. and Johnson shut-ins in yeah. that area. Yeah, yeah. 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 so yeah. it makes it interesting to think that the continents are really the recording device that we have for impacts. We don't even have a good That's estimate big. for how many impacts there have been on That's Earth. That's a remarkable, uh, remarkable way of conceiving it, yes. The, the, yeah. the so continents are the, uh, have, have recorded what's happened, and so we would have to, if we wanted to figure out how many there have been total we would have to do some extrapolation. From, you have yeah, to. Right. You also have to like back out the mountain yeah. chains because oh, the mountain yeah. chains disrupt everything. Oh, oh yeah, sure. And sure. so they sure. would, well, yeah, you know, gobble up any impact that would have occurred. Them up, yeah, so to speak. that's right. Um, and that has happened before, actually, in the um, Beaverhead impact. I'm quite sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it, yeah, it makes sense. Where's the Beaverhead? Impact? Beaverhead's in Montana. It's pretty okay. remote. Okay. And uh, but there's a mountain right. range that probably separates the, the two halves of the crater. Ate a crater. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing that occurs to me, and again, this is getting into the astronomy side of this, and there's this there's this fun fun interface here between geology and astronomy through these things. Um, but um, another reason why the uh, the distribution of these things on Earth is going to be tremendously skewed relative to the moon or um, a lot of other planetary bodies in the solar system is we, we have a, a fairly thick atmosphere. And uh, many of the impactors that would, in fact, create a crater on the moon would never make to the Earth's surface because they're low density, they're volatile materials, they're going to hit uh, and pancake out and vaporize at about 30 kilometers up. Which, air which bursts happens, and things. Which happens yeah. a lot. So, you know. Yeah. And uh, you can get air bursts, which has, and I don't want to go down this rabbit trail right now, but uh, that has uh, significant geopolitical ramifications because you can get something that looks a whole lot like a nuclear explosion, and it's not. Yes. And if that happens in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. we're all going to have a problem. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's really a lot of the motivation to me behind learning as much as we can about these things. Because the more people are aware that that can happen, the less likely we could have a problem. Uh, my my twenty five words or less version of that for those who can catch the historical reference or imagine the Chelyabinsk meteor in February of twenty thirteen happening instead, that exact event happening in late October of 1962. We might have be here. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. so. I tell you, we got lucky, too, because the Soviets didn't test their first nuclear bomb until 1949. Right, right. In 1947, 
there was a meteorite a, that struck near uh, Vladivostok. Sicko the Lean. Yes, yeah. Where we, yeah. Uh, there are pieces of that on the market. I have a piece Still, of it. You, yeah. You have a piece of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the, it's one of the most famous ones. Yeah. Um, and of course the most famous one of all is, uh, is Tunguska from, Tunguska. From, yeah, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. From 1908. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, had that, and by the way, speaking of stories, this is an alternate history story I want to write. And I don't know how big <laughs> it's, it could get way out of control, but, um, you know, you, you, you change the timing of that by about four hours or you, you have to, you know, well, you change some parameter in a straightforward but quite noticeable way. And instead of hitting middle of nowhere, Siberia it takes out St. Petersburg, yeah. uh, the original one, not, yeah. not the one in Florida. And, yeah. um, you know, you do that in 08 and, and I have gone to the trouble of, of superposing the uh, the blast pattern uh, where the, the where the trees were knocked down um, over a map of the St. Petersburg vicinity, and yeah, the city is gone and gone all the way out as far as Sarskoye Selo, where yeah. the yeah. where the royal family was. So you decapitate. So the the entire the, the, revolution would have been unnecessary. You, 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 well, you, you you temporarily decapitate the yeah, Russian Empire. That's right. Now yeah. I'm sure it gets reconstituted because yeah. there's going to be surviving relations and that sort of thing. Yeah. But the Saint Petersburg bureaucracy is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So back to Moscow. Yeah. Which was pretty much and a, probably not much a, of a town at that time. Probably, no, <laughs> Mo, Moscow was it was pretty big, uh, but was it? Uh, but yeah. When, yeah. You know, but and probably in all likelihood, human nature being what it is, a tremendous conservative backlash. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, so the really interesting question for the rest of the world is: yeah. is well, so what happens with World War One? Does it happen? Yeah. How does it happen? Yeah. What's yeah. it like? You know that yeah. sort of thing. So there's a lot of things to explore from that. So there, there is, and my my larger point here, and to try to bring this back under control, is um, <laughs> there's a there's a human element to this. You know, yes. even though we're talking about geological and astronomical events, there there can be a really significant human element. And um, again, back to the impact. Okay, we got we got date, place, size. What about the impactor? The impactor itself. itself. Okay. Yeah, it would have been, well, according to the same Earth impact data, you know, from, and comparing it to other craters of about the same size, the estimate is roughly around 350 to 400 meters. Okay. And the density, we're pretty sure, actually, on the composition of it, which is astonishing. The, yeah. uh, when we dissolve pieces of the breccia, which would have been the the concrete that was made sure. when this impactor hit, it blows up, breaks everything to pieces, everything comes back together and gets cemented up into this breccia. In that breccia, there are little tiny fragments of the impactor, we think, and very small, mind you, like microscopic. Sure. And so these are on the order of like 30 or 40 microns, maybe a, okay. a slightly bigger than that, okay. but, uh, but less than a millimeter across. Okay. And so these are um, uh, tetrahedral, uh, sort of structure, not tetrahedral, um, uh, octahedral, octahedral, right. octahedral, and uh, and they're made out of hematite today, but it probably okay. was magnetite at the time. Right. It could have crystallized from the vapor phase when this thing had actually blown up, and so when it, the, as it turns out, the the finest particles in the very top of an impact tend to be the most deformed particles that are preserved in an impact. Until you get to the crater floor itself, and we've never been to the crater floor yet. Okay, so we're suggesting, and this is to translate this into slightly more familiar terms for most people, uh, that this thing was a nickel iron or possibly stony iron That's meteorite, correct. but in any case, a pretty high probably density. nickel iron. Yeah, nickel iron, which yeah. is a very high density object, yeah. and of course, and those are disproportionately the ones that are found today, yes. simply because of their density and their high melting point, yeah. they're the most likely to survive passage through its atmosphere relatively yeah. intact. Yeah. So again, there's a there is a there's a selection effect there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The the fascinating thing, and again relating this back to human history, is we now know or we think we know that all iron that was found, smelted, used by human beings before the actual Iron Age, and there was some in the Bronze Age and even before. Yes. All of it was meteoritic. Yes. Certainly the Inupiat of North Greenland used the uh, 
I, I think there was one called the man and the woman and the dog, I think, were three wow. of the meteorites that were found okay. by um, by the Peris, actually. Yeah, so the Peris, yeah. you know, found the yeah. meteoritic stones as stone, as tools used by oh. this tribe. And, yeah. uh, and of course, bartered to, uh, to steal it then, essentially. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it wound up yeah. in the American Museum of Natural History. Yeah, I'm not, that, you know, but, the, but there was a settlement made, actually. It's, it's like yeah. the size of our car, it's right? It's huge, I mean, it's yeah. Many tons yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And it's not the only one, too, actually. The Willamette meteorite yeah. in, uh, in Oregon was found and uh, collected by, you know, folks who brought it to, who eventually wound up in a museum. But the, uh, oh, I, I can't remember the name of the tribe, but it was from the Willamette Valley, this tribe that lived there, okay. were able to recover at least okay. the rights to their stone and okay. then rent it out, I guess. Is well, essentially, there you, or, or sold there it. There you so, go. Sold, uh, you know, sold. I, th- it, yeah. I, think, I think renting it sounds like yeah, a really well, yeah, good that's idea. right. That's right. Um, well, it's a sacred yeah. object to them. Well, you well know. sure. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, there is um, there's a, a, a notorious biblical reference um, in um, chapter eight, <laughs> uh, at Ephesus, uh, Temple yeah. of Artemis. Uh, oh, yeah, there was apparently a yeah. I mean, there is a reference in the book of Acts to a sacred stone that fell from the sky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they you know, they had a meteorite in there. And, yeah. you know, to be perfectly fair about it if you witnessed an event like that oh my gosh yeah. you think it was a really big gonk and deal and you ought to do something special about it okay that's right that's i right. mean that's just you know um and getting back to the greenland thing uh, uh speaking of selection effects the you know disproportionate number of meteorites now are found either in Antarctica or in deserts because right. they're, they're usually yeah. dark rock because yes. either they're nickel iron, which is kind of dark anyway, yeah. or uh, or they're oxidized in some way on the outside. And so they're, they're these black rocks turning up on snow or on yeah. light-colored sand, and they're just that much easier to find. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, even the black stone of the Kaaba, to bring it back to uh, religion for just... Well be. So that's yeah. what a lot of people think yeah. it is anyway. It has a, a silver yoke around it. Uh, but the stone itself has been worn down for the the centuries of people, uh, you know, doing their uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. To, they let to, people touch it? They used to. I don't know if they I still do or not. It might have been curtailed. I mean, yeah, it could have um, could have been curtailed. Certainly. I mean, for one thing, it's it's not super well known, but the Wahhabi are relatively recent and extremely puritanical, and there are a lot of observances that they actually eliminated when they when they yeah. go yeah uh, so that might have ironically saved the rest of you know whatever that is yes that's know. right that's right um but yeah i have a feeling we won't get to uh analyze it anytime soon no no uh, no that's not gonna happen i'm sure yeah i don't even think a, you know a, a, an, an arabic uh scientist yeah, would yeah. go so far as to try to to well, uh, I don't know attempt could, to sample it, yeah. Do like Raman spectroscopy or something that wasn't destructive. Yes, even, that's right. But yeah, that, but even you, that, yeah. Clearly, you'd have to get permission. Oh, that yeah. Then there's, there's no way. Trivial. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that would be voted down. Yeah. And, and I don't know what happened to the one at the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, which was that one of the seven wonders of the world? You know, I'm not familiar with that one, actually. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what happened to it. I mean, I'm sure eventually it just sort of fell yeah. down or was abandoned or something. But, um, Anyway, okay, so that's a that's a, so, a homework assignment. For yes, <laughs> it is for me anyway. Yeah. What, what, I, what, I thought you were going. I thought you were going to go with Revelations chapter eight with uh, the mountain of fire coming no, from the that, sky. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's a whole seven other, steals or that's seven a seals. Other, yeah, wow. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, it's like yeah, these things have a lot of cultural significance. That's oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there have been many falls that have been documented in Kansas and other places. Oh. Uh, modern ones, where but there were small stones mostly that came down. Well, the implication of this being, um, and I'll talk about one of those in a minute, which I'm sure you'll be able to pile in on. But um, the um, the implication of of this is that it wasn't cometary; that it was asteroidal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and the way you get um, uh, pure nickel iron, or I mean, there there are asteroids that are virtually the composition of stainless steel, which has interesting economic implications, but um, the way you get that in the asteroid belt is there's some parent body that early in the solar system's history melted, um, and the, the, the version of it I always used to hear was that it was, was it aluminum 26, something like that. Anyway, mm-hmm. it, was a, it was a relatively 
short half-life isotope that there was enough of that if you got a, a large enough body accreted together, there would be enough of it for, for radioactive to, to melt the thing. Yes. And when it melted, well, well the heavier stuff sinks to the center. Yeah. Differentiation. The lighter yeah. stuff comes to the outside. Yeah. Um, and that's our same model for Earth. Sure. And eventually the thing solidifies and it's, you know, goes around the sun for a while and then it gets hit. Hit and, or hit or torn um, apart, perhaps, is the okay. other. Yeah, hit, hit, hit or torn apart, yeah, but I'm, yeah, I'm just going to yeah. go with hit for simplicity. Yeah. And it just gets blown into a zillion pieces, and a bunch of those pieces are nickel iron because they're from the core. Yeah. Sometime early in, in the history of the solar system, the larger gas giants apparently had migrated farther right. outward. Yeah. And, and when they did that, of course, it pulls things out of balance, right. essentially, and right. you have planetary crossing asteroids yes. and things like that as well. So even Venus now has a retrograde orbit that people think it was a close impact. It of course, has retrograde yeah. rotation. Rotation, yes. yes. Slow, but yeah. retrograde, yeah. which is a problem when it comes to terraforming. But yes, so, it, yeah. Yes. So Probably and then Earth. A bigger problem than the atmosphere. Yeah. Earth had its own uh, nemesis yeah. early on, too. And so that was... Uh, well, that's... You know, and that's the origin of the moon is the, the largest... Moon. Yeah. There you go. Uh, it's one of the leading hypotheses, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That a Mars-sized impactor right. almost... Right. Well, it did hit the Earth and then took a, a larger Earth, actually a smaller Earth, and... Yeah, made it slightly larger and then popped out our moon. Okay. And that coalesced. And anything is, larger than 100 kilometers is going to form a round shape. It's hilarious because it's kind of... Spherical. It's yeah. kind of intuitive, and yet at the same time, it's it's utterly fantastic. It I is. I mean, right? It, you know, these, uh, these titanic events that, you know, made things the way they are, and and the... the this is a, this is another kind of, kind of side note, too, but this is why I tell people that there is nothing like totality of a solar eclipse. And you absolutely want that experience at least once in your life if absolutely. you have the means to, uh, to get to one. Um, because that, uh, when the atmospheric conditions are right, you, you see the moon's shadow coming at you in that final you know, minute or so before totality, and there's this wall of darkness coming at you at 2,000 miles an hour. And you will never again mock primitive peoples for uh, uh, no. for freaking yeah. out. Because that's right. if you yeah. didn't know what was going on, you would lose it. Yes, okay? that's right. I mean, it, it's, it's the dragon that you, gobbles up. You the are world. not, your brain is gobbles not the wired to, no. to handle that. It just is. No, and no matter how rational you are, the first time you see a total eclipse, mm -hmm. it's it really is moving. And right. uh, I mean, yeah. well, you, you'd really have to divorce yourself from I've, your feelings I've seen, in order to not be. I've seen awestruck. three. All three of them have knocked me over. And, I've only seen one. <laughs> and um, you know, wow. And I'm I'm obviously hoping for April 2024. Absolutely. Um, I tell people <laughs> April my, the eighth, right? My I believe so. Yeah. And my my stretch objective, I have to take good care of myself and yep. dodge various exigencies. But uh, my stretch objective is to live long enough to see the one in 2045. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, that's going to be rough for me, I think. But, but yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm looking to 2024 for sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, and that one's. Yeah. Uh, I've already got reservations at a state park in uh, okay. in Indiana, well, actually, be, in the be path of totality. Be prepared to be flexible. <laughs> I will be um, flexible, but yeah, yeah. You but would, you know, it's it's actually one of the reasons we chose this place is because it's a mecca for geologists. Actually, that's right. where it was one of the first places where the U.S. Geological Survey oh, nice. operated out of. Okay. And so it was actually a, it's a hippie commune. <laughs> it was, it, twice it was a hippie commune. First of all, it was a religious hippie commune. Well, and then, uh, it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if Transcendental Generation did something there in the early to mid 19th. They did. Right? They did. They did. Okay, there you so, are. yeah, so it was David and Owen, there's, actually. There's our, there's our yeah. crazy spiritual forefathers. And so the, David the Owen, who wrote many of the first idealistic yeah. generation. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was, yeah. He was, yeah. A, he was, he was a Scot who came to the United yeah. States. Yeah. And he believed in equality of all peoples, right? So he was kind of a, it was it was natural for him to want yeah. to buy a commune that was already established and right. populated then with scientists. And so yeah. very famous uh, botanist who worked with 
with him there and yeah. several geologists actually that were there. So we're going to be there for the totality, I, I hope, if, yeah, well, again, if it holds together. Be, be prepared to be flexible. Yeah, yeah. You know, obviously, the, the general way to bet is the farther southwest you go along that track, the more likely it is to be it clear. Is. But yeah. we had none other than Michael Backage of Astronomy Magazine speak to the ASKC a while back, and he went to the trouble of digging up satellite imagery for April 8th of a bunch of past years, and there were plenty of times where it was the northeast that was clear and the southwest that wasn't. Yep, so, yep. you know, you just got to be ready it's the to, roll of the day dice, before it? Yeah. to, you know, to scoot yep. a few hundred miles in either direction, yep. depending yep. on what's going on. Um, so anyway, that, okay, so that gets us through most of the quantification. How, yeah. how um, big okay. do you think the impactor was and so, yeah. how fast was it going? And I know you have some ideas about the trajectory. So, well. so somewhere around 350 to 400 meters. We, we're not okay. sure, of course, okay. right? You know, okay. it's almost impossible to know what it, sh it is impossible to know what its shape was, sure, uh, sure. but, but we know when it hit, it really devastated everything down trajectory. And we already know that the tectonic rim is eccentric. Right. And the distance to the edge of that tectonic rim is more distant uh, from the northeast corner of that circle, uh -huh. the smaller main impact area. So it extends up by where Bartle is? Uh, um, not quite that far, but okay. pretty close to there. It's a All place right. called Bear Creek. Speaking of Bartle, scout camp here for those who are aware of that. Yeah, so it's a Kansas City connection there. Yes. And, and so the other thing was the uh, when we looked to the sides of this impact, it was brecciated there as well, but not as extremely brecciated. And so there were gentle folds, actually, in in one direction that would be off to the north, uh, I'd say the west northwest sort of from the main impact area. And if you go up around Osceola, actually, there are some river bluffs there that are pretty spectacular. They're about 120, 130, 140 feet high. Yes. And uh, when you I think see that, that's these, the one piece of this that most people have seen without realizing what it was. Oh my gosh, I, I um, can't I can't imagine how many fishermen and duck hunters have seen yeah. these incredible folds uh -huh. that are there. Um, it takes a lot of effort to push three miles of rock, probably 20 feet, yeah. and then cause it to fold and, and actually, buckle. Actually flip over. It right. flips and then yeah. it breaks the fold. Mm -hmm. And so it continued yeah. to, to go on. Yeah. So, so the target rock is actually a limestone, which is relatively brittle, but it probably was not brittle when it hit. A yeah. lot of it could have been pre-lithification even because it, yeah. it hit a shallow sea. 350, right. three, 340, 335 million and years you're ago. you're thinking the depth of that was... Probably no more than 20 or 30 meters at the most. At the most, okay. Yeah, yeah. so probably closer to yeah. five. Wow. Really? <laughs> uh, so it was pretty wow. pretty shallow. Yeah. And so, but but there was a, you know, a thickets of crinoids <laughs> that were in this area at that time. So this was this was a rock that we call the Burlington Keokuk uh, locally in southwestern Missouri. And... Uh, crinoids are these things they call sea lilies. And so the population of those things would have been all, all over the seafloor. And roughly about this time, there was actually a major decline in the, you know, probably not related to this impact, but then most of the decline happened somewhere around this time though, okay. in, in the crinoids. So we're not trying to draw a smoking gun to some sort of sure, sure. extinction or anything not, like not that. Not trying to explain it's, too much. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah, an extinction right. level impact, actually. Yeah. Even yeah. 350, 400 meters, mm -hmm. that, I think, falls under the regional category. Okay. So NASA, for their near-Earth object sort of program, which yeah. tries to track things from one kilometer, I think they're all the way down to like 400 meters now that they're oh. they're trying to find things. Eventually, they want to get down to 100 meters. I think there's a 140 meter threshold that they're really they're, yeah. they're trying to hit. Yeah. Um, yeah. This would this would have wiped out a there county easily. A, uh, <laughs> by, by the way, I should mention here there's a there's a power law relationship in the size of these objects such that you. When you shrink them by 10 times, that means there are 200 times as many of them. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> as it turns out, when you crunch the numbers, or I should clarify, when I crunch the numbers, I come up with a really, really, really large number of these things that if they hit us, would be in the 20-ish kiloton range and look a whole lot like a nuclear bomb. 
So yes. again, there's the there's the geopolitical yeah. thing yeah. again. Okay, so we're thinking 350, 400 meters, and it's nickel iron, so it's seven or eight grams per cubic centimeter, metric tons per cubic meter. Um, velocity, trajectory. Uh, velocity, probably. If we just take the average velocity of most things that are in, in these, for most meteorites, they're somewhere around 16 kilometers per second. Uh, per second. Uh, right. So that's about... It's about 20 times faster mm. than a 30 odd sex bullet. Right. That's one of the right. easy way f- ways for a Missourian to understand yes. it, you know. So, you know, a, a bullet's travel relatively fast. And so this would have been faster than a speeding bullet, you know, so not to, in, but without the well, Krypton. The, those of you, uh, those of you following along at home who want to do a little bit of math right now are welcome to compute the mass of a sphere of density eight that is 400 meters in diameter and doing 16 kilometers a second and what the kinetic energy would yep. be of that ke equals one half mv squared yep. and the the humongous number that's going to pop out of that um if, if you're using it's mks you're using meters and kilograms and seconds uh, when you use those units the um what pops out of that is an answer in joules j-o-u-l-e-s and it's 4.2 megajoules per kilogram of TNT equivalent. So you can figure the um, magnitude of this impact in, in megatons. And well, it turns out to be gigatons. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it is way, way bigger than any nuclear explosion we've ever, we've ever set off. Um, so obviously you don't want to be super close to it. Now you've got some ideas about the trajectory and the approach angle and direction. Yeah. So, so the asymmetry is a, is kind of a giveaway, I think, for the trajectory anyway. But you have to you have to keep in mind that during the Mississippi, of course, that the Earth was not like it looks today. So we are on a planet that's very dynamic, where these lithospheric plates, it's the crust plus the upper part of the mantle that move around on an, in an area called the asthenosphere. And so there's an area of partial melting in between that. So it makes these plates kind of slip around the face of the earth. And so as they come together, they also break apart. And in the beginning of the Carboniferous period, so that would have been lower Carboniferous, early Carboniferous time, roughly about 340, 350, I think it's about 340. 45, I think, is the actual number that they place on it with uh, absolute age dates. But uh, the North American continent at that time was known as Laurentia. And Laurentia would have been approaching Gondwana at that time. And so it would be another 55 million years before we finally collided with Gondwana to form the Appalachian Mountains. And so this was a, there was a precursor to that, of course, but there were pre-Appalachian Mountains in the east as well. But uh, so, yeah, so this would have been not only equatorial in latitude, so we weren't at such high latitude right. back then. We were also rotated roughly 45 degrees from where we're at today. So this thing, knowing that it is from southwest to northeast yeah. is the trajectory today. Right. In the ancient past, it would have been from the west to the east. Pretty, pretty close to west to east. West to east. Okay. Now, there's no way of knowing if it was early in the morning or late at night. Right. But it's going to be one of those is the interesting thing because right. it came out of the ecliptic, essentially. Yeah. And so the ecliptic, you know, would have been well, you know, mid-continental sort of like, you know, impact. And the way to bet is that it's um, hitting us from... The apex is the fancy word, which means yeah. early in the morning, because first thing in the morning, you are by and that by that I mean roughly local sunrise, you are on the leading side of Earth moving yes. forward into its orbit. Yes, and that is why for most meteor showers to this day, you've got to get out after midnight if you want to see very many meteors. Now, yeah, there there are some exceptions to that. We have a good one coming up, yeah. the, the Geminids in mid-December. Sometimes they come from the backside of the orbit to, well, wait to intercept. Except but. that it's after mid-December, and I got clouded out here. Arg, I'd forgotten about that. Okay, yes. We're recording this on Christmas Day of 2022, <laughs> by the way. And I forgot that, yes, that was two weeks so Merry ago. Merry Christmas, everybody. But next, yeah. um, but next year we get, another, we get another crack at the Geminids, I think. We certainly get a crack at the Perseids. 
Um, and I got to pull that together because I got a talk I'm giving to the um, online to the ASKC in the middle of January. Um, anyway, so uh, so yeah, that's the way to bet would be um, yeah first thing in the morning. Yeah, um, yeah. and um, certainly a lot more energy imparted if right, that were the case. Right. Yeah, well, noticeably more because we're yeah. we're doing about thirty kilometers a I second think, yeah. around the sun, and that's yeah. pretty dang fast, and yeah. that can you know that can really pump up that relative uh, velocity of impact. Obviously, yeah, square that, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, okay. So that kind of. Uh, so it's enough to that kind of quantifies that, and we think maybe yeah. a, you know pretty pretty low angle from the and from it, the asymmetry it's, and it's and enough early to, morning and you know a, a thing that's uh, you know to 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 revert briefly to English system or as Dave Barry calls it the normal human system of measurement uh, something about a quarter of a mile in diameter um, and, and it went deep enough into the earth to yes. bring up the granites that are down yeah. below all of the sedimentary rocks around right yeah. here. And so they they came up at least four hundred meters. And um, so okay, so suppose hypothetically um, you were off to the west of this when it came in, which seems like a good direction to be in. Yes. <laughs> um, what would have been a relatively safe distance to observe it from? Oh gosh, probably uh, more than a hundred. To use Dave Barry's system, yeah, more than a hundred <laughs> miles. More than and um, I think at 100 miles, you'd still knock down some buildings. Right. Uh, I think Springfield would have been leveled if it had happened. Right. And, of course, it was a marine impact, right? right. So that helps right. to mitigate some of the destructive force. But Except insofar that it creates a tsunami. So, it creates um, a tsunami, but um, in very shallow water, though, that, which is true. the redeeming yeah. character yes. of that so tsunami. There, there's not be that <laughs> there was a tsunami yeah. with it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we have evidence for that, actually, which yeah. is pretty interesting, too. Um Yes, you have to use a, uh, well, at the edge of the tectonic rim, a little bit of uh, reasoning that goes along with this. Now, it could be that you would also have ejecta that makes it that far out easily. Right. So there's broken fragments the, of church. The, the Melosh et al. model, yeah. the, their simulator, if I recall correctly, they... They, they do tell you whether or not you would be killed by ejecta yes. uh, in, a, yeah. in, a, in a given impact. So, yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, this thing, this thing actually would have, it did make broken chert that okay. was deposited in the limestone that overlies it, okay. essentially. So, the impact okay. occurred, you know, or roughly whatever it was, disturbed all of the chert that was being deposited at that time okay. or had formed prior to the impact that deformed it. And so, yeah, there's a lot of energy that goes with it. Small tsunami wave, I'm sure. Um, You wouldn't see any of the remnants to the east of this where the impact is today because the Mississippian is not preserved there. It would have been there at one time, but it's been worn away through the the ravages of geologic time and eroding things. And so that's the other issue with, like, you know, preserving things. They're either going to be buried or they're going to be eroded away usually. Right. Uh, So uh, maybe potentially around Columbia, though. There, there could potentially be some things in the... Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just to, to mention another semi-local example, the Manson, Iowa crater, I believe, is completely buried, correct? There's, That's correct. There's nothing. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we know there's a crater there, yes. but it's, it's absol- there's absolutely nothing visible on the surface. It was found through geophysical techniques looking at the, ge- the uh, gravity signature there. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, gravity varies, of course, from place oh, yeah. to place. Well, and, and that, I think... I don't know if that was the technique, but the way the Chicxulub crater yeah. was found, it was a similar. It was Pemex was yeah. doing surveys yeah. because that's. I think they, they drilled it first, looking for yeah. oil, and they seismic. Found this, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They found this really clear bullseye uh, yeah. pattern, but if you, yeah. you know, but if you're you know driving around in the Yucatan, it's not at all obvious. It's not at all obvious. No. Anything. That, there's that, that there's one doing. thing in the Yucatan that suggests that that was an well, not that it was an impact actually, because the drilling, of course, did that, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some cenotes that line up okay. along what would have been Interesting. the okay. periphery of Chicxulub. And, and remind uh, everyone, myself included, exactly what a cenote is. A cenote is like a sinkhole, essentially. So it's, ah, a, it, it's, okay. like, a, it's okay. like a cave that has collapsed. All right. And so okay. that's because okay. there is faulting along that area. So actually, the whole thing was buried by rocks younger than the Cretaceous. The, okay. So it hit right at the end of the Cretaceous, the second... 
or third largest extinction on Earth. Some people would argue that it wasn't even the second necessarily. Uh, certainly the worst was the terminal Permian, but the terminal Cretaceous was certainly right up there with it. Well, and it gets all the attention because it killed the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs. And, um, That's... and, and there was probably some contribution from the Deccan Traps, which oh, yeah. I should mention is a very large volcanic eruption in what is now India, yeah. which was at roughly the same time. and Before it. The, yeah. It was actually before. So yeah. there was the a bunch of things were already under some pressure from That's right. various atmospheric changes and yeah. probably, yeah. I don't know if the um, pH of the seawater had changed probably. yet. Probably. there was, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. the, so there were already these existing pressures and then we get hit and, uh, you know, the survivors are these furry little critters running around and here we are. <laughs> and things that can <laughs> yeah. swim. Actually, yeah. the, the, the birds too. So oh, yeah, yeah. we well, have to, uh, we have yeah, to admit, the, uh, so some of the dinosaurs the, the, actually the, made the, it. The, so, the, the avian well, dinosaurs. Yeah. Not, it was only yeah. the non-avian right. dinosaurs yeah. that really, yeah. you know, but also the, the, the terrace pterodactyls, you know, the, oh, yeah. the pterosaurs, all the, yeah. All the swimming reptiles that were around back then, other than crocodiles, right? You know, right. Alligators right. survived, yes. and yeah. so there would have been things that would have made it. Um, but, uh, the fascinating thing to me is the, um, and I don't know how this is known, but my understanding is that it has been determined, or at least persuasively hypothesized, that a single species of placental mammal made it through i don't yeah that's threading a needle yeah. okay i bet i bet there's more than one species yeah yeah okay yeah. and i mean yeah yeah because because yeah. okay the interesting fact that most people don't know is the mammals evolved at roughly the same time that dinosaurs did pretty, pretty early which is yeah. early in the, in the early in the triassic actually obviously yeah. more subtle presence oh, yeah. for a yeah. long long time yeah and then and swimming creatures then the yeah. ecology opened up yeah. in a yeah. big way oh it did yeah the terminal <laughs> permian was a, it was a good yeah. time to evolve up there yeah. well the end of the the end of the Permian was really, really bad for Earth. And so it would have, uh, any limestones that were around back then tend to be pretty deeply etched. Uh, so wow. there were acids in the oceans essentially at that time. Yeah. yeah um, I, well, one of the things that I think, gosh, this might have been a Gene Shoemaker lecture in, uh, at the Texas Star Party in, uh, I don't know, 92, 93. Um, I went in 90, 92, 93, and 94. Five and ninety-seven. It was one of those, and but it was probably one of the early ones because he was tragically killed in an accident at some point in the nineties. Yeah. Um, anyway, Australia. he gave a lecture where he talked about, it. and at that time it was thought that there might actually be a connection between Chicxulub and Manson. That it that those yeah. it, that those yeah. impacts might have occurred essentially simultaneously. I think the idea uh, of what they've done <clears throat> since then is they've drilled Manson, of course, and oh. uh, the age dates are coming up in the Cretaceous, oh. but earlier in the Cretaceous. But, so, so, but, not, but yeah. anyway, there, there yeah. was this idea then yeah. that, that it, you know, we might have actually gotten hit twice, and that oh, was yeah. part of the reason it was so That's bad. right. But, um, and there but, are some folks who still think that we got hit twice, and not necessarily Manson, but some yeah. other impactor that hit. Anyway, my, my memory of that talk was that he had this, this litany of effects of... of of a big enough impact, and one of them was something like the top 10 meters of the ocean essentially turning to acid. Yep. And, um, you know, obviously the phytoplankton, you know, the, the little calcareous shells on those guys, yep. they, they get dissolved. That's the yep. base of the marine food chain. You take that out, and everything above it has a problem. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, just these tremendous cascading effects of this, you know, again, overwhelming event. Well, that, the impactor was big enough to excavate a crater that would have sent ejecta into outer space. Oh, yeah. And when it right. came back in, of course, it would have ignited right. essentially right. once it hit. You well, know, and the uh, it's a reentry heat. The, yeah, the, 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 the effect as described to me was literally the... Just the intensity of all those meteors, literally, the light from them would have ignited dry vegetation. Yeah. Okay. 
And, and I mean, yeah, you just get this incredible, how did anything survive yep. aggression from it? But obviously, yeah. you know, things did. Um, you know, all of this to me feeds that strongly into, you know, Fermi paradox stuff and, you know, what's, what's really going on out in the wider universe. And, uh, you know, what a lot of people think is, well, a lot of people who talk about this sort of thing think is there is somewhere in the process, there is a quote unquote great filter. Um, I would attempt to add nuance to that concept by saying not a great filter. There's a whole bunch of little filters. And, uh, you know, enough of them over time, um, you can employ what I, again, am calling the the argument from algebra, where you take the Drake equation, which is that thing with uh, the, I don't know, eight or ten terms in it that you, you multiply down to get the number of um, technological civilizations okay. in a yeah, galaxy yeah, yeah. at any given yeah. time. If there are enough terms in that, and they have enough and they have a small enough value, we're alone. And that's not a very popular position. Uh, Brownlee, was it Brownlee and Rare Earth, the guys who wrote Rare Earth, uh, they kind of get into that. There's a book called Rare Earth um, that you can look up um, that essentially says, okay, there are enough things going on over the history of this planet that we now know about that we didn't you know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, that it's not looking so good for complex life in, in any abundance. Okay. No. Um, and, you know, and again, you, you want to be careful about how you talk about that. So, um, so we're kind of lucky, actually, in having Jupiter sweep up many of the fragments that's that potentially could harm us. At the same time, part of it. But they also send things our way. Sometimes. Well, that's the thing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a love-hate relationship. The, way, the yeah. way I like to describe that is it modulates the rate of impact. Yeah. You know, it is it is neither preventing them entirely nor accelerating them so much. Okay. Yes. So the question is, okay, how many solar systems are there out there that are sort of laid out like ours, so to speak? And the answer is that right now, we don't know because of our techniques for detecting them. We are looking for the car keys under the street light. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we're finding some really funky car keys under yeah, some street lights, yeah. but we're clearly not getting a anything like a truly representative sample. I think it's like 4,000 exoplanets, right. roughly. Now, yeah. we're, we're doing what we can, and that's the right thing, and I support it, and, you know, let's do more of it. But um, it is going to take a lot more work and a lot more advanced techniques and instrumentation, probably in space, to uh, yeah. to really start getting a handle on that's this. right. And it's going to take a while. I mean, oh, this yeah. is going to be the work of decades, if not centuries. Centuries, I think. Yes, um, I think you're to, right. To, you know, truly... We better get, get lucky. <laughs> um, so so the lucky part, actually, I would say, is not so much from impactors. Mm -hmm. We know that an impactor could wipe out humanity as we know it. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm. As it turns out now, we could have a bomb that does the same thing. Well, and again, we kind of talked about the interface between those things yeah. earlier. Okay, there's the... There is the, you know, kind of raw physical input phenomenon itself, and there's the human response to it. Yeah. And that response could be problematic in, yeah. some, in some situations. I, I like to think it won't yeah. wipe out humanity so much as wipe out civilization, I guess, is the, is the key thing, you know. So, well, although yeah. I don't know if you want to live in such an uncivilized world is the key, yeah, for that too. We, it would take some getting used to uh, yeah, that's yeah. that that can be a whole subject for a future whatever, future whatever of, it is we're yeah. doing. Here. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, okay, you know, I, I, I don't mean to to, to so. dismiss the value of civilization, but we are at one hour right we, now. We are at one hour, <laughs> so and, it's time to carry on with the second part. Oh, really? Of okay, this so so, so yeah. we're going to we're going to lunge into the second. part. I think the second part. Um, so so let me introduce my guest today, uh -huh. <laughs> Jay Malosh. Oh, yeah, uh, no, no, is, no, no, no. is a very famous uh, <laughs> yeah astronomer. Let me put it that way, I, I, and I'm, and I'm, a, I'm not, and yeah. a general. 
He's also an author. Uh, put it that I'm, way. I'm, so I'm, he's I'm an not, author. I am not Jay Malosh. I am another. <laughs> oh, Jay sorry, Man- <laughs> Jay Manifold. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, Jay Manifold. I, I have a feeling Jay Malosh doesn't have <laughs> yeah. an accent very much like. But he Miles. probably won't uh, listen to this podcast. He probably either. won't. <laughs> and, if he, and if he does, uh, hopefully, it'll sorry, feel Jerry, Jay. Yeah, it's like yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, for all the things we got wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but he's a he's a character too, actually, as, well, as you are. That so. he is. Yeah. yeah. So you you wrote a you wrote a short story about this in a way, right? Yeah. So so okay. So preface this um, pandemic. Oh boy. <laughs> we know the pandemics can wipe out humanity too, but we were lucky this time. And in the early days of the pandemic, who knew what was going to happen? Um, in October. October twenty twenty. You had cabin fever, and I think I probably did too, although I wasn't as constrained, perhaps, by some things. Um, You know, I was, at that point, I had given up on um, the startup I'd been working for and um, had been doing a lot of volunteering and enjoying it and, and feeling like it was meaningful and constructive. Uh, but I wasn't working, which meant that I could sort of, I wasn't working for a living, so I could sort of, within reasonable limits, do what I wanted to for a while until I had to get a job. <laughs> and, um, and you were down here, and at that, in that, was that semester all remote at that point? It, what was, what it, was there policy here? It was, uh, it was still on, it was still ongoing as a face-to-face class. But it was during my fall break uh-huh. that you and I took a trip. Yes. And, and so we decided to blow town we, here. We, we had kind of intended it to, to have a few more guys come along, but but it all kind of fell through for them. Yeah. So, it, so it turned into just us. We, we were going to take a trip to New Mexico at that time. And, we eventually uh, did, but that's another story. That's another story, too. Yeah. Um, so in October, we, we hit the road from Spring. Springfield here from and, Springfield, yeah, and, yeah. So, so I guess Plan A was uh, was the Trinity site thing that we ended up doing this past April of 2022, but instead, well, we headed we headed west. We headed and west, and so it's like you know, it's like I southwest. And I was thinking, it's like, man, I'd love to see. Well, first of all, I love Kansas. Okay, so um, it takes a special sort of person to say that, <laughs> especially when you live in Missouri. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Kansas, most people think it's really, really flat and ugly. And, uh, you know, you can see, you know, forever from there, right? It's just flat as a pancake. And uh, the sad truth is, of course, that it's not. And in fact, if you drove north and south across Kansas, you'd find out how hilly it is. And so there are many sets of hills in Kansas, in fact. And, um, and in fact, it's also almost a desert. It's very semi-arid and across the western part of Kansas. Well, and especially, well, I mean, my, my rule of thumb for this country is if you live east of the 100th meridian, you never have to think about water. And if you live west of the 100th yeah. meridian, you always have to think about yes, water. Yes, that's and right. And the 100th meridian goes through, well, Dodge City, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah, it's out in there somewhere is where you get that real transition. Through. So we started seeing the prairie right at the state line for Missouri. Oh, yeah. And then... You see it intermittently all the way to the Flint Hills, and then the Flint Hills, all of a sudden, you're looking across the sea of grass. And so we started this uh, this journey across Kansas, and I'd kind of mapped out. I had this idea, and I kind of wanted to flesh it out and uh, to maybe take some uh, video to see what it would look like if we did. Okay, so, so okay, to preface this, okay, so I have a a strong and high regard for Native American uh, culture, as well as uh, all oppressed peoples, I feel, you know, deserve a better break than what they've received at the hands of the Americans, uh, mostly the American government. And, uh, but the, the citizens have been just as bad many times. And so we took off to see sites across Western Kansas, especially to see Beecher Island, which was one of going to be the focus for this thing. It's like, man, what a great movie that would make to show the, the, you know, essentially the, the volunteer cavalry that was assembled to hunt down Native Americans and put them back on a, on a reservation after the Sand Creek Massacre. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we went this to see Beecher Island. In, Civil War and shortly thereafter, by the way. Yeah, 1860s. And, yeah, so it was like a, 
1860s into the early 1870s, and and so we uh, we headed west, went through Dodge City. Yes. See, no, actually, we cut north from Dodge. No, we did go we through Dodge through City. We went through Garden City. I Garden think. City, but we wound up going through the eastern part of of Colorado. Yes. And seeing the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. Mm-hmm. And it was especially moving, um, and it was especially beautiful too. Mm-hmm. We were there in perfect weather yes. in October, and it was uh, uh, in a high spot. You're 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 looking over the essentially what became Killing Grounds mm-hmm. back to 175, 178 years ago, and it was um, mm-hmm. it was like 1865, I think, or 1864. It actually, it was during during the Civil, Civil War. War so yeah, it would have been not quite 160. Yeah, well, it was before, it was after one sixty or eighteen sixty, yeah, but yeah, right. but it was like a but it was a very particularly moving experience to see that, and then to also see the uh, the fort. I forget the name of which one we old uh, Bent's old Bent's old fort. Yeah, yes, yeah. So it's it another just you know, traces of it left. But it's, yeah, but it's a fascinating. Place. Yeah, and you're overlooking the yeah, river yeah, there. Yeah, you're overlooking the Arkansas River. Yeah, upper yeah. Of it. Or Arkansas, as we'd oh, say in Kansas. Kansas. Yeah. Sorry. I, yeah it's, like, and, it's like New Madrid. Yeah, right? New yeah, Madrid, yeah. that's right. right. And, <laughs> well, I was born in Versailles. What yeah, can yeah, I say? There you go. That's right. <laughs> um, and I've lived in Vienna. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so it's. Uh, yeah, it was particularly moving to see the historic aspects of the West, and and you run across things like abandoned, like rail lines, yeah. and you know, very desolate, sort of deserty, sort of setting, and really, it's a compelling. Well, it it is if you like that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And as since I went along, it's evident that I do, and I mean, I really, I am just, I could wander around the high plains for a long time before I wanted to come back. It, to me, it's just, it's beautiful, it's fascinating, it's amazing. One of the things that kind of ties this together, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention one of the things you didn't, but um, a lot of what we were looking at was related to what Strauss and Howe call crisis eras in American history. And the oldest one was the Corretro, uh, there's actually a Pueblo yes. in western yes. Kansas. <laughs> Who would have thought? Which uh, doesn't seem like it could possibly yeah. be a thing. Well, then it turns out it was built by refugees from the Pueblo Rebellion in New Mexico yeah. in the late 1600s. That disruption, that event, was occurring at the same time as um, a bunch of, in many ways, similar events back east. King Philip's War in New England, which was a, uh, a Native American attempt to push the English off the continent, which came moderately close to succeeding. Uh, Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, which was a more internal um, um, conflict, uh, that era also saw the Salem witch trials. I mean, it was was very, very disrupted. And one of the great things I got out of this trip was understanding that those events and the Pueblo Rebellion were indeed tied together because the English and Spanish-speaking worlds had been, in effect, synchronized, if they weren't already before, by the previous crisis in the late 16th century, which was the Armada Crisis. Okay? And that, if you follow this sort of thing, as I rather obsessively do, as it turns out, um, made it overwhelmingly likely that about 80 or 90 years later there was going to be another troubled period when all the survivors of the earlier one who had some kind of instinctive, intuitive ability to manage and survive crises had died off. And so you now have people who haven't been exposed to this sort of thing and without meaning to be so, they are relatively inept. And there was another blow up. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we we El Cordaleo is the place that Cor- we Cordaleo. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so was, we were was, we were at Scott City. 
And yes. It was just north uh, of Scott City. This close is a, to this. Um, it's a state park, yeah. I believe. Yep. Um, and very nearby it is the, what's the name of the canyon that we went to? Oh, Punished Woman uh, Canyon. Punished Woman Canyon. Yeah, yeah. Which was one of the um, relatively few events in the Indian Wars after the Civil War and as part of that yeah. crisis. It, era. It, it, it was the last one, um, actually, where an officer was killed. Where, where, where an officer was killed. Yeah. Where, in this case, I believe it was mostly Cheyenne Indians. Yes, that's right. Defeated a U.S. cavalry force. Yeah. Uh, which didn't happen very often. They, they were off the um, reservation, um, and essentially the cavalry were out to yeah. round them up and bring them back. Yeah. And um, you could still see the rifle pits yes. on the uplands yes. overlooking the canyon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah they, had, um, they had the high ground. Yeah. You know, they were brilliant fighters. So we, and, saw, uh, we saw that one, and as part of the foray into eastern Colorado, uh, we also... Uh, drove through the the traces. There's almost nothing of it left, but there was a there was a Japanese American internment camp. Yes, yeah. And, and again, that you know, okay. So now yeah. we're at the next crisis era, the era, the the Depression of World War II, yeah. and um, I think there is someday in the future. We obviously both hope a documentary to be put together that kind of ties these together, and possibly again with the Trinity site. That's right. In how this. Society and its predecessors, both English and Spanish, have responded to crises. What they have done to manage those crises, yeah. and uh, you know, our objective, obviously, being that um, if if I may phrase it my way, um, that that response be relatively humane in the sense that it be something that achieves a net saving of human life. Uh, as both of us strongly believe the Manhattan yeah. Project did. Yeah. Um, it's it's a little more ambiguous in the case of the Indian Wars. Um, you know, obviously they were exterminated and their descendants in some places have done rather well. Um, but it's... Um, I think there's it's still tough. a lot of it's reckoning tough. that needs to happen. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, it's yeah. obviously hard. I mean, one of the things I heard recently from an acquaintance is the in the state of Montana, the the, the COVID statistics were the um, the natives were seven percent of the population and thirty seven percent of the deaths or something like that. So there's Huge. there are still some, um, and this is a dreadfully overused word, but there are still some inequities that are oh, uh, yeah, many. structural yeah. and, you know, we, we need to think carefully about what we can do about this. It is institutional, I think. You know, it's like um, when, we, when you look at um, what governments do to, to reconcile past, you know, transgressions that they'd made against native peoples. It's there's a very sad record of any government being being able to do that. My own heritage is Welsh, of course, right? And so the Welsh and the English uh, had always been at, at loggerheads forever, and uh, until the the Welsh finally became the the monarchy during the right. Tudors, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. and so there was there was this idea between the Normans and the Welsh were more closely you know aligned than what they were right. with the Anglo Saxons, yeah, Axons yeah, right. and Danelaw right. and all that yeah. group, right? And so and so uh, yeah, so the Welsh finally made out in the end, sort of, mm -hmm. until yeah, okay, well then they got subjugated again, but yeah, <laughs> it's a you know it's a long history with the Welsh, but you know when you come from that. You're part of that diaspora. Sure. There is this certain feeling. It's like, you know, that oppression is bad. And there's this equalization that you'd like to see. Of course, Welsh became the coal fields for much of the Industrial Revolution. Right. So the south of Wales, a very industrial place. Right. And my, my, my people were just on the outskirts of that, still right. farmers. Uh, so I was, you know, I guess my family was fortunate in that aspect and having migrated yeah. to the United States in well, the 1840s. Well, a lot 1840s. of people feel that way, <laughs> what with one yeah. thing and another, you oh, know. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, this was, this was the great escape. Yeah. It and, was, uh, it was. Yeah, you know, it was, a, it was, and this is obviously touchy, but this, it was in effect the great escape even for people who didn't come here voluntarily. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, again, it, it, that kind of, kind of loops back to that, you know, what do you do to achieve a net saving in human life? 
and uh, so anyway, so so let's bring, let's bring it back to, yeah, to yeah, Kansas, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. so we're driving. We we visited the the massacre site. We visited the the, uh, the internment camp first, actually. And the, one of the reasons I wanted to visit this internment camp was because George Takei, right. Star Trek, right? You know, and um, he wrote a book called "They Called Us Enemy." It's a graphic novel. A great book, but he didn't actually spend any time in Kansas. Uh, I was already familiar no, with the was... Topaz site in Utah. He okay. was in he was in California. And that's I think. what yeah. I thought. That's what yeah. I thought. So were... in the Klamath yeah. in that area. Yeah. So in the uh, the Modoc, I think area yeah. of of California. Yeah. But he, uh, you know, it's compelling. It's like you know, he was an American citizen, right? A child, you know, Absolutely. born in America, born here, you know, born and it's like, and so he, but he was still, but, you know, yeah, incarcerated yeah. for yeah. the duration of the war, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and there was never really any justice to that until, I guess, in the 1970s, maybe there was some. But. Um, there, there was eventually some reparations. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, which is, uh, which is an interesting point, because it, it wasn't just the incarceration of these people that was the problem. It was that uh, their assets were, were taken. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, So you lose that on the generational wealth. You, you could yeah. argue that... Um, maybe as a security measure, locking them up somewhere was sort of justified. Although, who knows? I mean, you know, I've heard things like, okay, there was an active Japanese fifth column in places in South America where they were a significant minority and things like that. Who knows? But it's the taking that's the problem because we have an amendment in the Constitution about that, yeah. and you're not supposed to do that. Yes, that's okay? right. Yeah, um, illegal search and seizure. Yeah. Well, Fifth yeah. Amendment, and yeah. it's, it's yeah. the takings clause. You yeah, know? Um, and so you know that that's an area where yeah, you kind of need to true that up at some point. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I think you know we did something. Who knows? You know, uh, obviously not great for the ones who didn't live long enough to see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so there was that whole, that whole piece there. Um, and yeah, so the, 40 so the, acres and a mule never happened either. No, not and, on any large scale. No. And so um, there, there, that's one of the nice things about Kansas actually is there's a, there's a town called Nicodemus, Nicodemus yeah, and so yeah, Nicodemus absolutely. was settled by native, you know, by, yeah, by yeah, black yeah, Americans. Yeah. And, uh, so African Americans who came yeah. to Nicodemus yeah. to farm and, um, you know, that was a success story actually, you know, for, for, African American, uh, eventually, you know, but uh, yeah. So this, how do you make it good for everybody this, else? Uh, <laughs> this trip was a mix of uh, a mix of geology and relatively recent um, human history. I was actually sick on the trip, so he didn't get a whole lot of geology. Well, from, uh, well, I, 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 was, I didn't. I didn't ask as many questions yeah. as I might have for various reasons. Yeah, but, but I still. Um, yeah. But you know, we uh, yeah, we 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 survived. So we survived, and and um, I'm I'm slowly getting over two years later yeah. the same issue that I was so, having then. So hopefully, it's on the <laughs> mend right now. So but, uh, we 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 get through this, and um, and I decide, well, you know, I ought to I ought to turn this into into some kind of narrative, and um, so where we go? Uh, so where 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 did I go? Uh, with go the Gove County, I right? Go, go, Gove County, um, which you know I don't remember if yeah we were there because we looked yeah. at we almost went to Little Jerusalem, and we did go to Castle Rock, yeah, and we went to I think we went to Monument Rock. Yeah, maybe we just went to get no. We went chalk to, chalk pyramids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we went to was, Castle Rock and chalk pyramids. And, yeah, and chalk pyramids. Yeah. Uh, these are both in Gove County. It's uh, it's just off of I seventy. It's about I don't know two thirds, three quarters of the way west to the Colorado border. Uh, so it's pretty far out there. It's pretty dry. It's short grass prairie. Uh, what in Eurasia they call the steppe. Um, ours is aligned north south instead of east west, and you know. There, there, there are interesting analogs between, say, the Comanche and the Mongols and things like that. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, the Great Horseman. Yes. Um, but um, anyway, so so we're out there, and um, so I um, I start conceiving of of the elements of this story, and um, so I don't know. I, I I don't want to give too many spoilers here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna short circuit this but, just but a little bit. So so the, when we were out there while you were working on that storyline, I was interested in the storyline for Beecher Island. Yeah. So Beecher yeah. Island, yeah. we went on to Beecher yes, Island, which is just barely into Colorado, as I recall, 
or it's just in Kansas. It's, it's so real it's close right on to the line. line. I think and it's on the Colorado side. I think it is. It's, yeah, and it's, it's fairly far north. What is across from it on the Kansas side is almost to Nebraska. Almost, almost. Um, yeah. So, so it's you, on, you're it's in, kind of the, in that corner. The Arikari uh, is the oh. streams, the yeah. little Arikari, and there's a there's a few of them that, through there. Does that flow Most to the Platte? Or I think it must flow to the. Else, or it's, yeah. It may go to the Smoky Hill for all I know. Yeah, but, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure. If on only that. there were yeah. a way to <laughs> use an electronic device to look up information. Yeah. yeah. Is it important? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting because Beecher yeah. Island was dry. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. there's hardly yeah. ever any water oh, yeah. in Beecher Island. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so very, Beecher Island was just... Very seasonal, intermittent. Yeah. Right. Grown up yeah. with willows, essentially. Yeah. And uh, you overlook that site. There's a... They held a reunion there very, after 100 very, years. It's very, very aesthetically... Interesting. It's yeah. it's as, almost as interesting as the uh, Sand Creek Massacre yes. site, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. in this case, um, the American military got their comeuppance. In fact, mm -hmm. it's a very compelling story. In fact, so the uh, Captain Beecher, I think it was Captain uh, Lieutenant Beecher, maybe it was. I think it was a Captain. I think, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but there were fewer than a hundred men. I think that were in this uh, column okay. that was chasing the Native Americans. And this was Roman Nose who was leading the Native right. Americans, over over a thousand uh, Native Americans in the in the conjoined tribes. And they were they were pretty upset. Yeah, this was after the Sand Creek Massacre. And, mm -hmm. and so they uh, they eventually turned and, and struck at the uh, at the cavalry. They were, they were actually volunteers uh, at this site and um, when they struck, they pinned them down for days, and there was no water to drink, so they had to dig straight down in the island to get to the water table where they potentially could fill up a canteen or two every once in a while. Uh, all of the horses were shot and killed, um, and they made a barricade out of the horses in order to like not be killed themselves, and uh, errant shots went through, and I think there were 20 some that were killed by wow. the Native Americans. Wow. They led five successive frontal charges. Mm -hmm. And in the very last one, uh, who was a warrior chief was Roman Nose. And Roman Nose was killed. He was like, he was like six foot six, I think oh, is wow. what they claim. Um, so he was a huge guy yeah. with a Roman nose. Yeah. And that was hence his name. And so he had a, um, he was, Considered to have been sacred, I think, at that time, where bullets could not kill him. And, of course, that didn't turn out mm -hmm. the, like no, he had hoped. And things, uh, yeah, so great. after he was uh, yeah. killed, they, they essentially left. But the heroics from the, from the cavalry perspective was that they sent two people out to try to get help. Mm -hmm. And they left in the cover of darkness and were able to crawl out, mm -hmm. essentially, and then walk the 70 miles. To uh, to the closest fort at that time, I think it was Fort Wallace, uh -huh. and so at Fort Wallace they uh, mm -hmm. they got they mustered some help there, and so the people who were sent to the rescue, even though the Native Americans had already left the battlefield at that point, mm -hmm. seeing no reason to continue the fight after they'd lost their great leader, and uh, the people who showed up to help the cavalry were Buffalo soldiers. Wow! And so you know yeah. it's. Uh, I think I'd make a great movie, you know. So oh, if you're yeah. a, if you're out there and have uh, influence in uh, in right. Hollywood, just think yeah. about the uh, the. You wouldn't have to have much dialogue, I don't think. Yeah. I think the Native American dialogue would be the toughest to uh, to acquire for that. But uh, yeah, it would because you don't want to make them sound silly. No, no, no. You know. Um, I, but but okay. In my mind, I see Adam Driver as being Roman Nose, but that's probably the wrong thing to do. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, but it All would right. have been somebody, you know, Roman knows what some, actual some actually Native American yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. actor who would be able to play yeah. that role. Yeah. And so, but uh, yeah, Beecher was killed actually. And so hence his name was given to that little piece of property that's uh, nestled in the uh, cottonwoods and yes. overlooked by lust bluffs of the Arikari. Yes. Again, that's it. It, you know, it's very attractive. Now, as you said, the Sand Creek Massacre site is as well. And my... My impression of it is, is 
you know, my God, how could Albert Bierstadt have painted this? It just, you know, it'd just be spectacular. Yeah. The, oh my gosh. The way the trees are arranged yeah. and the, yeah. you know, the little bit of topography that's there. And, yeah. You know, you'd, um, my, my probably only regret about our visit to that site is that it was kind of at midday. And earlier yeah. or late in the day, it'd just be spectacular with a low, yeah. with a low sun angle, which yeah. indeed is what we got at Beecher Island because they were, we were there late in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just, just amazing, amazing stuff. Hmm. So that brings us to uh, back to the Chalk Pyramids, I guess. You know, chalk, maybe pyramid, chalk Pyramid, Castle Rock. A, a.k.a. Ma- Monument Rocks, uh, yeah. Castle Rock. Um, and these are... M- moderately well known regionally. I think a lot of people in Kansas know that they're there if they even if they haven't yeah. been to them. Um, yeah. So so I, I have to point out actually um, the chalk pyramids are made out of chalk. Yeah. As is Castle Rock, it's made out of chalk as well. And so this was a time period on Earth when there was a sea that stretched across the Great Plains, if you can believe that. So, you know, you can believe it because I'm telling you, because I'm a geologist. And I know <laughs> this. Um, but, but it stretched all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Arctic Ocean. And so what they find in the these... Western tr- Interior in Seaway. Western Interior Seaway. Yes. It was a follow-up on the uh, what was known as the Sundance Sea during Jurassic time. Okay. And, uh, and later it was followed by the Cannonball Sea, okay. which was an enclosed... Once the you know, Western Interior Seaway dried up, there was that's all that was left behind was a puddle in, in the Dakotas, but it was in the High Plains. It was before the Rocky Mountains existed. So, and so it was an interesting place. So the chalk pyramids are loaded with fauna from Inoceramus, which were essentially like uh, oysters, and there were lots of oysters as well. And then they also find giant fossils out there of swimming reptiles and. Oh, wow. And all sorts of things like that. And so, in fact, that was the site of one war that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. And that was called the Dinosaur Wars. Okay. So, <laughs> from Cope and Marsh, actually. Okay. So, Cope okay. and Marsh fought wars trying to secure dinosaurs to bring back to the American Museums. Relatively few East. casualties in these wars. I think. Yeah. Um, I think the casualties uh, were eagles, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, that is the story of the chalk. Pyramids, from my perspective. Uh-huh. So, so what do you what do you see in them? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I mean, I decided to to tie all this together and go on a on a, on a burst of crazy creativity. Um, and I have actually written um, a couple of stories now, and I may write others. Although I'm not sure I've got anything anything immediate queued up. Where in the in the mid 21st century we have a time travel. So this is not a Super original science fictional concept, obviously going back at least to H.G. Wells, um, but um, it it is uh, it is a technique that is that is selectively used to investigate some things in the past, and um, the um, I'm I, I'm deliberately hazy in whether. Uh, going to the past can affect the present. Um, I'm implying strongly that it essentially cannot, um, but with the occasional interesting exception. And, I think Ray Bradbury had one called the uh, butterfly uh, effect. Well, well, the sound yeah. of thunder is, yeah. is, is one of okay. his two or three yeah. most famous short yeah. stories, and the, yeah. and the guy steps on the butterfly, well, and, 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 and next thing you know, and comes back, <laughs> and you know, and the the alphabet's different, and yeah. there's a, a you know some authoritarian you know, government in place in the yeah. States and it, and it's, um, yeah. Um, well, um, you know, and, and interestingly enough, there's, there's been some very recent work and I'm, I'm entirely unable to, to quote or reference this properly because I didn't take the trouble to, to, to pull it up on my phone here, but there's been some very recent work done where a guy is saying, this is a physicist and he's done some math and it's, it's not crazy. Okay, it might not be true, but it's not crazy. Um, that, you know, yes... Warning, we, quantum mechanics we, ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. That, 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 yes, we, in fact, could time travel to the past, but, in you know, any paradoxes would get resolved. So, in other words, you, you can't go back and change yeah. history substantially. And so that kind of fits nicely with what I'm wanting to do here. Because my idea is we send, you know, basically we send people on 
on interesting adventures to the past, and 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 of course something goes wrong, and and you know something has to happen to respond to that, and and um and, and, and so that that's what this one is. It's a uh, it is a uh, it is an expedition to in fact observe the impact that created the Wablo structure, and um, in in my scenario there is a. There is an area, and, and according to one, uh, one of those uh, um, time-lapse things you can dig up out on YouTube, there was a, a, a spot around 340 million years ago where uh, most of Kansas was actually above water. Now, that might not be true, but hey. I, Central I, Basin Platform, I, I, I think you're right. I found yeah, it, yeah, and yeah. I, I yeah. found it, and I'm running with it. Yeah, okay? yeah, so, yeah. So, so well, the Ozarks I, certainly you know, like the central core. So, so, yeah, so when I yeah. had, when I had Kevin do a do kind of a kind of a sanity geology check on this, I, uh-huh. I'm uh, you know I'm uh, I'm going to take some of his advice, but not all of it is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, you know, right 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 up until it really but screws, it's really good. Right actually, up until yeah, it really I, screws my story up. I'm convinced so, that it's really pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So so anyway, the, the the these people are 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 set up in a couple of places um, in in the the Kansas of that period, and they're um, and they're there to observe the impact, and and and, the, and it is about their their adventures and misadventures, and uh, some of the places we've been talking about in this conversation come up in the story. Um, and I just I had a lot of fun with it, and I, and this is where I will admit that I was deliberately trying to make it romantic, somewhat in the style of there's a very famous um, award winning science fiction story called Rogue Moon by uh, I think it's a novella length. It's uh, and I'm I'm going to mispronounce the guy's name, but it's something like Aldous Budras, um, who was. Uh, Ethnic Lithuanian. He was American, but he was ethnic Lithuanian. Wrote several pretty famous things in you know mid century So this would be fifties, sixties when he was uh, when he was doing most of his work. But um, and so I was I was shooting for kind of that romantic side of the story as well, which who knows whether I'm any good at it or not. But I but I took a shot at it and. Uh, and anyway, so it's um, it's kind of fun, and I my intent is to publish it along with several others um, in the not too terribly distant future. Um, I I intend to get them professionally edited, and and I I have people I can work with to do that, and will give me an ISBN and, and handle the handle the formatting for electronic publication, um, and kind of go forward from there. But uh, but it. Much of it grew out of that trip. So, um, so what and, was your inspiration for writing science fiction to begin with? Uh, well, I've been a science fiction fan since I was a kid, and there, I know what I like. All right, and and it's a little old fashioned now, um, and it isn't exactly space operas, but it's just you know basically straightforward adventures with. Human characters, um, probably not going to do any alien stuff. And um, I am particularly drawn toward alternate history, which this is not. But uh, I have any number of alternate history ideas kicking around that I've started to do some things with. And, uh, yeah. So, so your story is set in the middle of the 21st century. 21st century. And so it's not far in the distant future right. here. It's not and super distant. It's, you know, 30-ish yeah. years out, so, 30, 40 years out. So and, that's a, and, that's interesting that you should mention that. Yeah. How does that fit in with the Strauss and how hypothesis? Well, I, I, it, it assumes that we survive. Um, okay, so there's a crisis. Coming. It doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it assumes that we survive the current, you know, kind of dumpster fire situation that we're actually already <laughs> in, um, and that you know things, even if they get worse, they don't get so much worse that you know the country's not intact, and you know that kind of thing. Um, it, it certainly assumes continued technological advance. Um, it, um, by implication, the. Um, younger academic slash um, sure. uh, graduate student age people in the story are going to be the next um, baby boomer like generation. So there is um, 
uh, th there's that piece to it because if it's uh, set in I don't know um, the late 2050s and these people are in their 20s or just maybe 30s, they are people who are born from about the mid to late in this decade um, on forward a little bit. By which time, we should be um, again hopefully emerging from a crisis era, which means that the children being born will have no memory of it, If you know, obviously not if they're born after, or even if they're born late enough in it. Um, one of the things Strauss and Howe point out is that the, the true baby boomers, in a sense, started getting born in about 1943. So it doesn't quite align with the demographic baby boom of 46 to 64, it's more like 1943 to sometime in the very early 60s. And these people would be the mid-21st century analog to that. So to that extent, they would be uh, temperamentally familiar um, to, well, people like you and I, and uh, especially to uh, what we were and what we observed in our peers in... Um, you know, roughly the 1980s, maybe. Um, so, you know, 70s, 80s kind of thing. Okay. Um, so anyway, that was a, that was a, uh, a slightly um, uh, dilatory explanation because uh, Kevin actually had to step out of the room for a minute, but he's back now. So uh, Well, I did want to ask you, it's like you, you mentioned – other authors in the, I don't want to give anything away either, but oh, yeah. so who are some of your like ideal authors when it comes to science fiction? Um, well, you know, they, they, most of the ones from kind of the golden age, so-called, um, Is that, um, which would be, you know, to my mind, that's pa mid, Paulson or? mid 1930s all the way out to probably, probably mid to late fifties. Yeah. That yeah. might be a little bit of a broad definition. Yeah. Uh, it's the stuff that um, that I was sort of toothed on um, in my adolescence. And, um, you know, a lot of the ones are, are ones that people have heard. Uh, you know, the big three are, yeah. are Asimov, Asimov, Asimov yeah, Clark, yeah, and Heinlein. Yeah, right? yeah. Who, who hasn't um, read Foundation and Earth in a whole series? Well, for, the, yeah, but, well at, least the, and, at least the Foundation yeah, trilogy. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, with Clark, of course, the classics from 2001 sure. and Childhood's End. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and maybe, maybe some other so, things. Hammer, uh, Hammer of, some, uh, some of the what short was that stories. one? Is, there was one called Hammer God, which I don't think I read. Yeah, that's uh, Lucifer's yeah. Hammer is is Niven and Pornell, and Niven okay. Niven usually comes in about fourth if anybody mentions anything yeah. after the big three. Um, Heinlein, of course, has a massive Kansas City connection. Okay? Yes, yeah, uh, wasn't born there, but he grew up there. It B appears. Born in Butler, Missouri. It, born yeah. in Butler, yeah. and and you can see the house he was born in. You can't go in it because it's a private residence. It's not a museum, but it's got a little sign outside. Um, but you know, massive Kansas City presence um, in 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 a lot of his stories. Um, a, a big chunk of, of time enough for love, and most of To Sail Beyond the Sunset are set in Kansas City. Parts of some of his earlier works, uh, including The Puppet Masters, uh, yeah. um, Starship Troopers, man, it's like um, that's one of the classics, right? For... Uh, oh, oh yeah. I mean, uh, now to me, yeah, and in, ineluctably, that's going to get a lot of attention. Yeah, the subject matter. Um, yeah, you know, to me, the um, kind of the three you've got to read are um, speaking carefully. Um, Mutazar's Mistress, which is about politics, yeah. and uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, which is about religion, and Time Enough for Love, which is basically about sex. So <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, you know, lots there, um, provocative stuff in 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 a lot of ways. He had a um, that's one of the nice things that, that science fiction does for us, actually. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it helps it's, you think a little bit it, more. You know, it, it, it's, yeah. It, non lateral, it, more lateral thinking than. It's, it's, yeah. it, it, it's going to be a reach. And, um, you know, he certainly tried to logically project a lot of things. Um, you know, and the interesting thing is the, you know, the relationships among some of these guys in particular. Um, and a lot of people know this, but during. Uh, during the war, Heinlein was able to pull together a ostensible 
Naval Research Laboratory, which I don't know how much it, it actually produced, but the main practical effect was it, well, it was probably to save um, Isaac Asimov and Sprague de Camp and maybe Frederick Pohl, I'm not sure, but it basically got them in there so they wouldn't so, be just, you know, uselessly slaughtered somewhere. All right. I think uh, um, Arthur C. Clarke, too, was working on radar, was he? He was working on radar. Yeah, um, yeah. So he was, yeah, he was, well, not, I don't know if anybody in Britain was really out of harm's way, but at least he wasn't at the front. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, he was, uh, he was doing some stuff. The fascinating thing is that all these guys were, you know, GI slash greatest generation. Yeah, yeah. And well, Raul, that is a that's a generation that the baby boomers had kind of a fraught relationship with, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, because they were, you know, they were the man, and we were gonna, you know, by God, we were gonna rise up, and we weren't gonna let them, you know, push us around, tell yeah. us what to do. But um, you know, those guys wrote, and and there were there were some women. But it was that generation that wrote the vast bulk of the science fiction that really inspired a lot of younger people to... Oh, the 1960s you know, television get, shows. Get, that get came, into, see, get oh into my these gosh. kinds of careers and, yeah. you know, and do this stuff. Um, you know, and then later on with the, with the silent generation, you got more new wave stuff, which was, uh, you know, there's some value in it. Um, it tended to be... Extremely cynical at times and downbeat. Mostly drama, um, though, sort of like uh, adventure drama. Uh, but yeah. the, you know, again, the 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 you know the the earlier stuff. The you know, again, I don't want to say space opera, but the more you know, almost purely adventurous stuff, where it's you know human beings encountering some you know aspect of nature in a in the strictly literal sense of the word fantastic setting, and uh, you know, and getting something out of that. I mean, I just, I just ate that stuff up. I think the first, um, well, certainly the first couple, three, I remember reading, uh, the huge, huge classic Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time. That's just, yeah. you know, that won a Newbery Award. It was, I mean, it was one of the most famous books for young people to read in the, you know, mid-late 60s. Um, uh, the first Heinlein I read was Half Space Suit Will Travel. <laughs> um... A lot of fun. It was, and it was one of his juveniles. So I have to pipe in with one of my oh, favorites. Right. Cord yeah. Wainer Smith was one of mine. Uh, he was remarkable. Uh, uh, so I have not Nos read much of his stuff. Australia, I think, was a redigestion of a book that was called "The Boy Who Won Earth." Or okay, he, it was a it was a gambling sort of like uh, uh, book, okay. but he does populate it with a lot of aliens and things uh -huh. like that. But yeah. the, like, you know, like a cat-shaped girlfriend and things okay. like that, <laughs> you know, yeah. but in a human, humanoid cat, essentially. Yeah. But uh, yeah. uh, fascinating, like, uh, the humor is what comes through in that book more so than it's like, so, you know, combining uh, humorous writing with with, uh, with science fiction, there's a lot yeah. to be said for that. So that's that's kind of fun. The uh, Well, the other one that's like, you know, sometimes these writings also presage the... It, you know, the actual technology oh, sure. that gets developed eventually, you know. Absolutely. So uh, it was um, Arthur C. Clarke who who came up with the idea of an elevator to take you to space, yeah, essentially. So, and that well, that was a that was a story that took place in Sri Lanka. Yeah, in, in Sri Lanka, yeah. uh, Fountains of Paradise. Which Fountains I've, of Paradise, I've, I've yeah. I've actually read yeah. part of, but not all of. Yeah. But, well, and of course, you know, in his case, there's the very, very real world geosynchronous communication satellite. Oh, yeah. Which, um, you know, as, as any number of people pointed out, if he had somehow, you know, patented that, he would have been a billionaire many, mm -hmm. many times over. And he, at, at one point, somebody mentioned that to him, and, and, and his, his response was something to the effect of, what would I do with billions of dollars? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, but I mean, he did okay anyway, so he yeah, was, I'm he sure. was fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, what a talent, and, you know, what a, what a oh, genius yeah. to... Uh, yeah. To have given us the fruits of his efforts, I guess. Well, it's, you know, it's, um, I, as somebody wrote something online many years ago, and I don't know who it was, and I think it was just in a comment on a post somewhere, but I think it was when he died. And somebody said, you know, walk outside tonight, watch a satellite go overhead, pull a phone out of your pocket and call somebody on the other side of the world. <laughs> you're you're memorializing him when yeah. you do that. And yeah. Just, just right. phenomenal. Um, and of course, the the incredible, just almost 
hypergolic combination of him and Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the visuals in 2001 still hold up. Yeah. The, uh, speaking of technological ideas, there's a reason the iPad is called the iPad, right? Because of the news pad in that. And it's the same form factor. Nobody's kidding anybody about where yeah. they got that idea yeah. from. All yeah. right. And, you know, and there have been, well, you know, we all have our numbers. communicators now. We, we? we do. We, <laughs> we, have got a, we even have tricorders you can we, add yeah, as like a little, pretty, you know, pretty nearly Thunderbolt uh, additive yeah. to. I mean, you can put on a, like an infrared camera, you know, sensor and things like that. Well, it's like, that's you know, amazing. I think I, I am. I am a cockeyed optimist when it comes to medical costs, as there are more and more things oh, yeah. you can plug into these. Like I'm the, holding the, uh, on my phone, yeah. and and you know, go from you know spending some ungodly amount of insurance money on on a bunch of testing to you know, yeah. here here's a drop of my blood, put it in this thing, and boom, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, and we're I think we're getting there, but <laughs> but yeah. So so I don't know if it was you I saw on a Facebook post or not, but. I think it probably was. <laughs> it was a it was a uh, ceramic set, you know, that that spelled out with the letters. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah, and I got that from somebody else. But it was it was no L with the letters rearranged to spell Elon, and uh, you know, and 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 here we are. I mean, he may be the closest thing to speaking of Highland. He may be he may be our dealer's D. Araman. I don't know, and uh, obviously a guy who's definitely got a mind of his own. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I probably like him maybe a little better than you do, but uh, you know those <laughs> things are going to happen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, and I I'm not kidding myself that I'm going to like everything the guy does either. Okay. Because you, you know you don't you don't get everything you want from somebody, right? I, I think <laughs> the flamethrower was a pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was he was going to going to sell the flamethrower thing. I don't know whatever happened to that. Um, <laughs> I, I think he turned it into a space company. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, some, something like that. Uh, but that's fascinating, and, and the, the the development there. I, you know, notwithstanding a certain foreground controversy at the moment, the development there that I really look forward to is Starship, because that is, if he can make it work, if if if, that is really going to be the game changer, because that will allow. You know, truly cheap access to space, truly large quantities of material and large numbers of people. Can you expand um, upon it? This, I, I don't know space. that I've heard of it. It yeah. is a very large heavy lift vehicle uh, that would be completely reusable and that, you know, essentially you could get, and I mean, we could look this up, but my memory is on the order of 100 metric tons of light, and you could just do it over and over and over and over and over. So instead of, you know, literally burning up a Saturn V and throwing yeah. it away every yeah. time. And, and reusable. And, and you know, yeah. com completely yeah. reusable. It yeah. drastically changes the economics of yeah. what we put into space and why. So are um, we going to go to the moon for that? To, well, to build a base there? I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit bigger a fan of the moon than, than most people. And I'm not going to tell this story right now, but I was involved with a so-called new space, as the term went, startup, about 20, 25 years ago that unfortunately, or not, uh, never got funded. It's before uh, the government but it was, privatized it was, everything. Right, it was going to involve, um, it was going to involve initially a, uh, uh, a lunar sample return for profit. Okay. Oh. Um, and there were a lot of interesting aspects to it. Uh, it never quite metaphorically or literally got off the ground. So I'm a little bit bigger fan of going back to the moon than some people. I mean, there's a lot of people who, you know, and, um, you know, David Brin's one of them, and I'm pretty darn sure Bob Zubrin is one of them who's, who's, who are saying basically, screw the moon, we need to go to Mars. Um, to my mind, the moon is an excellent test bed for mm -hmm. a lot of the things we're going to need to do in other places anyway. And it's three days away instead of months to years. All right? Certainly easier to launch from, um, I would think. Significantly. And, yeah. and, but the other aspect of it, and this is going to sound so, so superficial and banal that, that it'll, it'll sound silly, but I really think it's profoundly true, is you know if you take somebody, and I won't say this is true of you, but if you take the average American outside at night and look at the sky, how many things can they recognize? 
Not very many. Not I mean, very many. Like, the the, so, <laughs> the number of celestial yeah, objects they can recognize yeah, is basically yeah. two. It's basically I, the sun and the moon. The sun All and the right. moon, pretty much. So it, if yeah. you're doing stuff on the moon, you're doing something someplace people can look yeah, at yeah. and recognize. Yeah, it's more tangible. Okay, it? it is yeah. way so, more tangible. So, so in order to become right. a spacefaring civilization, let's say... Yeah. If we maintain civilization to become a spacefaring civilization, we have to take the baby steps in order to. to get, we have to change our mindset, I think, well, and stop dwelling on the problems down here and start dwelling on the or solve the problems down here again, and start. You know, speaking carefully, you have to do it in a manner that is in accordance with human nature, yeah. because. You can develop all the technology and do all the amazing things you want. Do you remember where you were when they first uh, stepped on the moon? I was sitting in the living room of a house at 4400 Northeast 49th Street in Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City North, um, watching it on a big black and white television and watching my parents step to the door, look out at the sky, which had the crescent moon in it in the southwestern sky that night and shake their heads and come back in and sit down every few minutes. And I was like, yeah, sure, we're doing this. Of course, you know, yeah, I've been, no, I've been yeah, following yeah. it. It's, it's I had just, the same you know, experience. It's, it's a thing, was, and my parents were yeah. flabbergasted. I was and on it, Leech it, Lake yeah. in Minnesota, uh -huh. yeah. and uh -huh. we had friends over, my other mm -hmm. survey friends. My dad was a surveyor for USGS. Uh -huh. So I was sitting there watching this on TV, and said, so my parents hauled me in, you know, and said, you got to watch this on TV. I was like, what? You know, I'm outside playing, right? Well, I was, I was, I was like, going to watch it on TV. That was that was going to be my priority. It, but, I'm glad but, I got to see it. Yeah. You but, know? but my reaction to it well, was not like theirs because I didn't grow up in a world where that was a metaphor for the impossible. Didn't it impress you so much? That it altered the rest of your life, right? I mean, it, I could say that it did that for me in a I way. I had already been hooked on astronomy for a yeah. while. Okay. I, well, so, I had. So it was, you know, I don't want to dismiss it as just an incremental development. Yeah. But I had yeah. gotten real used to the idea that we were going to walk on the moon. I was excited. I was happy to be seeing it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it wasn't like. I wasn't getting zapped by that moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you know. So it the, wasn't catharsis or anything like not, that. But, not like that. But but um, but it entered the consciousness, and all of a sudden, every kid wanted to be either sure. an astronaut or a rocketeer oh, yeah. or oh, some yeah. sort of you oh, know yeah. something now, to do with space. I think the one that. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, no, by the no, way, no, so, because you're on a, I, um, I won't go back to your train of thought. I, I, I think the the one that may have had a greater effect in a lot of ways, and of course we just had the anniversary of this um, effectively yesterday, was the, the the Christmas Eve Earthrise photo from Apollo 8 yeah. and the broadcast. Yeah. I, I mean, Kevin, I can hear like it yeah. was last night Jim Lovell's voice saying, wow. God bless all of you on the good earth. Yeah, I mean that was just incredible, and, yeah. and and I knew it was incredible as a nine year old kid, you know. Yeah, um, and that incidentally, as Rand Simberg among probably others has pointed out, that's when we won the space race because uh -huh. you know we didn't we didn't actually have to land on the moon other than to kind of underscore the point yeah. of getting people to the moon yeah. which incidentally is something that could very well happen with SpaceX in the next few years is a free energy return trajectory like what Apollo 13 did except on purpose um, is not super hard to do not with the computers and, and the technology um, that we have today. You know, yeah. And, and it's, and, I mean, to think you know, that basically you yeah. go along for the ride, you're coming back, you're not, you know, I mean, you're not going to land, you're going to fly out to it and then right around it. And, you know, and if we <laughs> do that before the Chinese, it might be good. Well, it's always good. To, I think competition brings out the best. In oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it does. So, if people know but I wish what I wish the Chinese the very to, best and, that they can and, do and, too. And try you know? to compete. Yeah. And, and no question what they're going for. The yeah. sample return that they did with yeah. Changi five or six or whatever it yeah. was. 
that was blatantly a rehearsal for a lunar landing yes. because yeah. they did it as a lunar orbital rendezvous yeah. Yeah. with two spacecraft, which you absolutely don't have to do if all you're doing is landing and, and doing some robotic stuff and picking something up and flying it back. I, I think I know what your response would be to this question, but mm-hmm. the supposed moon base that's on the dark side of the moon? Oh, God. <laughs> well, um, Conspiracy theories rule these in the 21st century. Who would have thought? As Pink, <laughs> as Pink Floyd reminds us, there is no dark side of the moon, that's really. Right. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's all dark. Um, well, far side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, let's turn this in a direction of something <laughs> that means something. Um, uh a radio telescope on the lunar far side is a great idea. Yes, yes. Uh, an yeah. an optical telescope actually isn't that good an idea. I mean, it'd be nice, but um, there's a there's a couple of problems with optical on the far side of the planet. One is, and this isn't well known at all, but there is this. You may know about it. There is this bizarre electrostatic effect that happens at dawn on the moon, where we think, although it hasn't been directly observed. That this literally this this cloud of dust, uh, electrostatically suspended, just rises up, and it's like ten meters deep, and it st- stays there for minutes to hours, and then it and then settles it drops, out and again, then, and yeah. then it settles back down. Yeah. The only thing you put there is going to get that crap sure, all over it. Sure. All right, yeah, so yeah. so you got that problem, yeah. and 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 with optical, as we've seen with James Webb, which this is where I do a mea culpa. I repeatedly predicted that James Webb would never fly or would fail in some way, and I'm kind of glad to say I was wrong about that. But yeah, uh, yeah. but it, it was having so many problems for so yeah. long that at some point I just decided, you know what, they're never going to pull it off. But it did. But um, it's at uh, it's at Sun-Earth L2, so it's one and a half million kilometers um, on the, in the anti-solar direction from Earth, um, which gets it away from uh, the problems the Hubble had with, well, basically half the sky is covered by the Earth when you're in low Earth orbit and, yeah. and some other things. Um, it does not get it out beyond the next step you want to do is go out a little over two AUs from the sun to get beyond the the nodal the, the, the dust that makes oh. the zodiacal light. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, but it's the next best thing, and uh, but its detectors have to be cooled by the sun shield uh, to at least forty kelvins, and one of them's one of them's colder than that. One of them's like six or seven. Okay, all right. Um, so doing that on the lunar far side is a problem yeah. because you're going to be in sunlight half the time. So you're going to have to have some kind of sun shield. And, so you can have an uh, orbit that will actually put you in sun 100% of the time if um, uh, if you're like not on the ecliptic, if you're off of the ecliptic and you could. Well, I'm not exactly sure what the geometry is of what you're describing. Yeah. But uh, you're, you're going to be... You know, obviously, once you're far enough away from Earth, you're never going to be in shadow. Or yeah, almost yeah, never. yeah. And in this case, it's literally never because this thing's in the halo orbit around that point. Yeah. And and it, it's literally never going to be in Earth's shadow. Yeah. But you you know you you've got to it's it's black body temperature or gray body temperature or whatever the proper term is is going to be, I don't know. 250 kelvins, maybe 250, 260. Which is way too warm to do the kind of infrared work that you want to do yeah, because yeah. infrared light is so much more penetrating. Yeah. Uh, to me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot here a little bit. The astonishingly successful thing about the James Webb so far is that they have been able to put out a bunch of images that were taken in the infrared, and in some cases, the fairly far infrared, and make them aesthetically compelling to ordinary people, okay? Because obviously you have to arbitrarily assign colors sure, sure. to make it look like, like something. All of the, the okay. Orion um, Nebula and all, right. of, yeah, birth, birth they ground. They have the, been able yeah. to do that. Okay, we are coming up on two hours, so I don't know if we want yeah, to. Yeah, this is two hours. We can um, we can yeah. go a little bit longer if you want. Oh, that's so, fine. Um, it's, it's up it, to you. It's so. up to you. I, I, I have more. I have more material. Um yeah. Well, I was just going to mention also that uh, wouldn't that be a great place to have a near Earth object observatory? <laughs> well, <laughs> where you where you can see these uh, things that don't have much of an albedo to to be able to. Of course, it's yeah. all in the optical you know um, realm. But 
Yeah, that's that's a really interesting problem. And I tried to crunch the numbers on that some years back as far as how big a network of telescopes you need. Um, what... Um, what I would do with that, being what I am, is try to employ a lot of amateurs. Um, and, and because of the advances in both hardware and software, there are some remarkable things going on now. I mean, I know a guy in the ASKC who lives up in Smithville. He's the guy who posted the Christmas tree thing that I shared, uh, Christmas tree nebula, who is, he is punching down to 18th magnitude from his driveway. Wow. And it's, I mean, he's got a, Pretty good size scope, but it ain't great big. It's it's not you know it's not you know a twenty or twenty four inch thing. It's probably I don't know. I'm guessing wildly. It's probably twelve or fourteen. But that's the quantum efficiency of those CCD detectors is so good, and the software now where you can do the image stacking and processing is so good and so fast that there are there are things that moderately good amateurs can do now that you couldn't, wouldn't have seen outside of a professional observatory a couple of decades ago. Hmm. And with that, if you get enough of these people searching the sky, you're going to get some pretty good coverage. Okay. Now there are, there are areas where we want to do better. We want to do better in the Southern hemisphere there's not a lot of people in the southern hemisphere, yeah, and much light, you know, less light pollution, right? Uh, yeah. You know, so so there's not well, but uh, I don't mean there's less light pollution, although there is. I mean there's fewer resources to yeah. you know basically jump in on this. So you know you want to scare up a bunch of people in Chile and Argentina and South Africa and and Australia and New Zealand yes. to cover as much of that part of the sky as possible yes. because yes. we can't see it from up here. Yes. Uh, and the other problem, of course, is looking generally in the direction of the sun. If something comes out of the side of the sun, we're probably not going to see it until it's right on top of us yeah. and catch it at all. Which, by the way, may have been the case with the Chelyabinsk thing, because you know, yeah. that was at dawn, and it was like coming out of the southeast. I don't mm -hmm. know, I'd have to look at the trajectory. I'm sure they figured it out. They, they had expected one that day, um, but it was it was not the one that actually... It was actually, not that one, <laughs> it right. That yeah, one. yeah, 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 it was yeah. a different one. So they're much more common than we recognize, right. and then they... You can't see them. The yet. story behind that, by the way, which is one I've told to a few other people, and I may have glancingly mentioned to you a few times, is is one that started coming out in the mid '90s, uh, the early early to mid '90s. Um, the Sky and Telescope ran a piece about an event over um, an island in the South Pacific called Kusai, where uh, K U S U I E A I don't know how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, um, where some fishermen saw something as bright as the sun one day while they were out, and they didn't know what it was. And, it, you know, eventually it came out, okay, yeah, that was one of these, again, relatively volatile uh, material, you know, impactors coming in at 30 kilometers. It pancaked out, vaporized. There's this huge flash of yeah, light. Yeah, Okay. Uh, well, what Sky and Tell did was... Um, they ran the numbers on, okay, if it was, you know, that bright, that duration kind of thing, and figure how the energy is coupled as it comes out of that impact. Uh, I think it was something like 110 kilotons. Okay, so real substantial. Um, so anyway, I'm at the Texas Star Party in, I think, 95, and I had made a little donation. It wasn't much. It was like 30 bucks to a light pollution reduction fund. And for that, I got this prize of um, getting to go up on Mount Locke to McDonald Observatory and spend half a night up there at the, oh my gosh. Uh, the 82 inch, which is the 2.1 oh. meter telescope yeah. with a, with, with an observer. Yeah, oh, it's a pretty good time. That is cool. Uh, yeah. Anyway, oh, so. What do you want to look at, Jay? So I'm up there hanging out. Well, well we weren't doing that. I mean, I, yeah, I was yeah. hanging out with, uh, uh, her name at that time was Beth Clark. And um, and she was she was doing some asteroid. Work. Is that Clark and Bird? Um, or the the what's the star stargazer star uh, star day? No, Deborah Bird is uh, okay. Is somebody else? I met I'm her thinking of somebody else. Yeah. She, okay. She okay. Um, the um, so anyway, um, so I'm up here and and with her and with uh, with another guy who had done the same thing. He made the donation and we get to talking. And, and he's up there for, for the same reason. 
Um, and his name is Bob Jen. And well, he's passed away now, but he was, uh, I start, okay, she's explaining her asteroid work, and I'm asking some questions about, okay, so what, you know, you're looking for evidence of, you know, it's, again, it's kind of the history of these objects, and it relates to the heating, whether it was a woman in 26, or whether there was maybe a solar episode that heated them all up, and it, it was really cool stuff. And, um, but anyway, at some point, because we're talking about asteroids, I mentioned the impact thing in the article in Sky and Tell, and... And Bob Jent pipes up and says, yeah, I was uh, in the Air Force, and I was on the spy satellite program, and we knew those things were happening all the time uh -huh. in the mid-60s, and we couldn't talk about it yeah. because it would reveal too much of our capabilities. It was classified. Sure. But because what they were looking for, of course, was the flashes of light from nuclear explosions. They were looking for violations sure. of the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty. Yeah. And they started seeing flashes of light. And they were the right magnitude, but they were in these totally random locations, usually way out over the ocean. Yeah. yeah. And they realized very quickly this is a natural phenomenon, and they were able to make some pretty good guesses about what it was. But they couldn't publish. Sure. Okay. So basically, it didn't come out for 25 years. And then finally, after the end of the Cold War, yeah, yeah. you know, this stuff started. And you find out there was an entire yeah. cloaking, you know, of yeah. the space program that the um, military had. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and, and that ties back. Now that space, <laughs> space ties wars. back to the, the initial Hubble problem yeah. with the mirror. Yeah. The Hubble mirror was one of a production run of 24 of those. The rest of them, almost all the rest of them, were launched and pointed down for National Reconnaissance Office. The NRO did some extra steps that they didn't tell NASA about in building these things. And that's why when the Hubble got up there, it was... I mean, it was better than any telescope on Earth, even before the fix. Yeah. But they figured out after a few weeks or months that, yeah, we got a weird thing going on with the optics. And it was that firewall. They they weren't, you know, getting the whole story about how to build <laughs> these things. Okay. Okay. It's probably a good thing we have secrets in our government, I think, is, well, you know, but there are secrets you'd... It's hard. Yeah. yeah. There, there, yeah. Was a, there was a proposal way back in the day, and it, it was like early 70s, and I could dig it up if I had to. But there was a commission that was pulled together to kind of discuss this whole problem. And it had, among other people, Edward Teller on it, who had a reputation for being this tremendous hawk and all this, which yeah. was a little overblown. Actually, it was very overblown. But one of the recommendations that commission came back with was... That's it. Declassify everything. Yeah. yeah. Just be totally transparent well, because to be whatever you're yeah. doing, somebody else is going to reverse engineer sure. pretty quickly anyway. Yeah. And it, you know, it would have been a pretty gutsy approach. And again, pure risk acceptance. But we'd be living in a different world if we'd gone that route. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, this has been fun, you know, um, so two hours and eight Joy. minutes and yeah, so I'll do some editing and put some pictures of the places we visited and yeah. some Wablo stuff up. There's a, there's a few pictures of yeah. us floating around out yeah, there Yeah, I know there are, yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah, so let's, uh, we'll put a wrap on it and uh, I mean, is, is there anything else you'd like to say before? Um, you know, I think that's good. I, I foresee doing this again oh i want to do it I'm, definitely i'm trying I am to, enjoying the hell out of it I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get down here about yeah. every three weeks uh -huh. and i think um it's not going to be exactly every three weeks because i already know i can't do it three weeks from right now but um the uh you know we could uh we could do this 10 15 times a year probably. that'd be fun you know okay. it'd be a lot of fun uh and i don't think we're going to run out of stuff to talk about anytime soon I so, don't think so. Yeah. Interesting people have great conversations, and so that's what makes it all worthwhile. Well, I, I try to be worth people's time. Well, so you are. We'll you are. You are. <laughs> anyway, Jay, thanks. Thanks Thank for you, Kevin. 
Thanks for being my guinea pig. This uh-huh. is the, the first uh, right. podcast here. I should, so. I, should, I should pull up guinea Cheers pig, now. The, guinea pig got, noises on my do you have any? Do you have any uh, comments as to uh, what you want the podcast named? It's going to be on my Stratigraphics <laughs> channel. Oh, dear God. So, um, I'll, um, um, that, that's the kind of thing that I don't do too well on my We'll, we'll come I'm up gonna, with something. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have to think about it and email yeah. you a few, yeah. uh, a few suggestions. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to truncate it here. So, okay. anyway, great talking with you. Cool.